I'd like to bring to order the February 12th meeting of the Tiverton Town Council. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mrs. Mello? Council Perry? Present. Councilor Shabbat? Present. Council Ryan? Present. Councilor DeMadiris? Present. Council Edwards? Present. Council LeBeau? Yep. Council Hilton? Yeah, you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> present. All present. <laughs> Consent agenda 1A approval of regular session meeting minutes of January 22nd, 2018. Council Perry abstained, absent. Approval of executive session meeting minutes of January 22nd, 2018. Council Perry abstain absent. Approval of special town council meeting minutes January 7th, 16th, 2018. Council Perry abstain, present but did not participate. Approval of special town council meeting minutes attending police chief interviews January 30th, 2018. Executive session. Councilors Edwards absent, abstained. Approval of special town council meeting minutes attending personnel board meeting to open resumes for town council January 31st, 2000, town administrator, excuse me, January 31st, 2018. No councilors present. Approval of special town council meeting minutes, executive session, session attending personnel board interviews February 17, 2018. Councilor D. Madeira, Shabbat, Edwards, LeBeau, and Ryan abstain, not present. Re receipt of minutes from the following boards and commissions. The Planning Board, Economic Development Commission, five. Co uh, Conservation Commission, two. Charter Review Commission. Correspondence received and filed, there are none. Approval of tax abate, uh, assessor abatements. Susan Gill, Planning Board Administrative Officer, report for January. Please fire and DPW overtime reports for January. Would there be any counselors that would like to remove something from the consent agenda? I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and second. All those in favor? Um, the open forum public forum for the presentation on Tiverton's annual financial report ending June 30th, 2017. I'd like a motion to hold that until um, the chairman of the school committee arrives, which will be around 8 o'clock. So moved. Second. Motion's been made and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Public hearings, advertised public hearing, public hearing on zoning ordinance, Article 6, Section 1. Yard regulation and Article 6, Section 3, accessory structures and Article 2, definitions, Article 5, Section 1, district dimensional regulations. Uh, Attorney DeSisto. Uh, oh, <laughs> B1, uh, it's okay, there's no need to pay attention to me. Um, public hearings thing. on yard regulations. B1. Uh, yes, this is okay. a continuation from uh, the last uh, meeting that we had, uh, and there were some issues uh, as to this. It deals with uh, um, accessory or other structures in the uh, front yard. Uh, some questions were raised uh, on that as to whether or not there should be some exceptions uh, to the uh, uh, ban on having these structures uh, in the front yard. There are uh, some car bottles uh, that were placed, and as you can see, uh, in the attached uh, uh, ordinance, and uh, basically, if your uh, property is over five acres, uh, you are committed by right to have structures uh, in your front yard, so long as they comply with the other zoning regulations for that zone. <coughs> and secondly, uh, if there is to be a garage uh, in other zones that would be placed in the front yard, uh, the requirement is that they're not um, facing the street but uh, are to the side. That's basically. Um, in layman's terms, what the changes were from the initial ordinance. Any discussion from the council? Um, Councilor Hilton. 
Um, I would suggest, and, and I was the, the person who asked the, for some of these revisions because I thought the ordinance as written was a little too prohibitive. Um, but I do think, and it would be good to have these changes sent back to the planning board to have them, you know, look at them and see if they're comfortable and have thought all the potential options all the way through. So, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I would like to have seen the regulations be a little re less restrictive, especially for the big agricultural properties, which I think this will do. Um, and to consider the possibility to help people out who don't have garages or tr and are trying to find a way to get them on their lot. But I would like to have the planning board weigh in on these. But I, I do have a second question. Well, maybe it's the next item. So um, I guess what I'm going to suggest is to say thank you to Tony for doing these. And could we send them back to the planning board for their opinion and then a vote? Any other? If, if not, and I beg your point. Go ahead. But uh, my suggestion, if that's the case, and that's fine. Uh, would be that the official action of the council uh, would be to remand the matter uh, to the planning board for their recommendations as to these amendments. That would make it so that there's no um, uh, conflict with the uh, time requirements, not only under your ordinance, but under the ADA Act. Too. This is not something that's being driven externally. This is an internal uh, provision uh, that the staff felt we should do, so there's no um, pressing need other than uh, just a cleanup for this uh, issue that we've been encountering. <coughs> Madam President, is it possible to put this in front of the public so they get a better idea on what's going on? Well, I'm going to open the public hearing right now to see if anybody here would like to speak on it. Well, um, meaning what? Man? Well, I just, if we're going to change all this stuff, it's okay to speak about it now, but whatever changes are, the public needs to be aware of what we're doing or what we're trying to do. To, we're restricting their rights on their property again. So how do you I suggest just, we do I just that? don't agree with any of this. I don't know why we're doing this in the beginning. Um, if I got a, a one acre yard and I want to put my garage in the front and it's 25 feet off the road or whatever the setbacks are, so be it. Why we got to keep screwing with everybody's rights on their property? That's all I'm asking. And if the people of Tiverton don't want to come out and they, they don't want to put, have their voice heard, you know, that's up to them. But I think they should know what's going on. Well, it'll eventually come back to us once the planning board gives us recommendations. Is that correct? That's correct, yes, and this was advertised. For tonight? Yes. Yeah. That's why they elected me to be their voice. They don't want it. Okay. <laughs> um, is there anyone, at this point, I'd like to open the public hearing on this matter. Anyone from the audience like to speak? Name and address, please. Uh, Peter Mullins, 83 Captain Circle. I spoke about this last time. And um, if the direction of the council is to bring this back to the planning board, I, I assume there might be a public hearing there, too. Well, that's fine. But there are a lot of faults here yet. One obvious fault is uh, <laughs> looking at the first, first article definition, 3A. You'll listen to 3A going to be a new ad accessory structure this is one example I'm going to probably stop at that because this is so disgusted about how things are being done and public laws are not doing not being put together properly well 3a is uh, already on the books and 3a is listed as adult book video store the retail sales of magazines books photographs films and videos and blah 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 it's already posted in the the ordinance. So he's going to put another 3A here, which is wrong, because you can't r overwrite one or eliminate then that one and uh, forget it completely. And then uh, there are several other options here that are really not really looking to the law as it is. When I was on the planning board, the problem was not accessory structures in the front yard problem. It was putting accessory structures in the side in the rear lots, uh, rear side lots, not side lots, but side lines. And now it's gone overboard and it's gone out of its <laughs> box here. It, you're talking about uh, heights, you're talking about front yards, and also uh, the size of the accessory structures limited to a certain amount, a magic number that was drawn out of the air. So 
Thank you. So it depends on if you're going to carry on tonight. I'll speak more about it. But if you're going to bring it back to the planning board, I'll hold off. Well, we don't know if we're going to do that yet. We haven't had a vote on that. Continue the meeting tonight, I assume. Uh huh. Anyone else from the audience like to speak on this subject? <coughs> Anyone else? Tony, will you look at this? What he's talking about, three A? Um, I'm confused. Yeah, I'm a little confused about it too, but uh, we'll, we'll straighten that out when it gets to the planning board. If you go to the current ordinance, three A, article, uh, article two, right? Definitions. You'll see a three A, three A there. Well, let's get this one out of the way first so we don't have to talk about it anymore. You'll see a 3A there listed as uh, video bookstores and blah, blah, blah. You're overriding that. With a, we're calling this one a 3A, the definitions for accessory structures. Thank you. Well, I'm looking at the old one and I don't see. Okay. Again, I'm looking online. I hopefully that's the current issue of the ordinance. Wouldn't this be? Okay. <coughs> any other dis any further discussion from the um, council? Madam President. Yes. Um, I just want to reiterate again that uh, my opposition to the size uh, restrictions, um, where it says in the yard uh, regulations, no permanent accessory structure, except provided by whatever we have here. Um, the uh, I'm still opposed to the height. Uh, and height and size and square footage um, because I think it penalizes people who are on smaller lots but may still have the desire to build something there so uh, you know I think that we need some sort of a basic regulation so you're not you know creating a, a downtown area <laughs> out of somebody's property but um, we also shouldn't be you know very restrictive when it comes to people's private property amen any other discussion from the council? Um, Councilor Shabbat? Yeah, I, on the same uh, paragraph where it says, um, no accessory structure shall be located closer than six feet to the primary structure. Is there a particular reason for that? Six feet from the structure? This was sent to us. Um, yeah, yes. And then it, it really, you get close to six feet, it's not really an accessory structure. But, but that's something we put in. That's a policy consideration. If that's not what you want, it can easily be changed. So it's, if it's closer than six feet, you would call it part of the structure? Is that what you're saying? Kind of odd. I don't know if that's something that's... that's trying to figure out. And is there a definition of a permanent accessory structure? I'm assuming that you put in the no permanent accessory structure to take care of dog houses and nativity scenes. Yeah, and I'm, 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 yes. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, for instance, somebody might uh, you know, have a temporary structure for, uh, I'm not going to call it a greenhouse, but uh, covering for uh, plants and protection in the wintertime and things like that. So that's not considered to be permanent. Okay. So. Permanent is a garage. Yeah. Well, we also mentioned gazebos and dog houses last last time so I'm just trying to make sure that I understand what this is alluding to I don't know if it covers the gazebo or the wishing well what about the council Hilton uh, um, only because I've had this experience in putting something in part of that too also has to do with the footings and how it's attached so you can actually have a bigger structure that's not permanent if it's not um, on you know a, on footings or a permanent slab if it's on concrete block or things so there I, I don't know everything about it but I do know that that's one of the things that determines the difference between permanent and temporary is the footings and how it's attached to them it yeah. The state. yeah I just want to make sure that this is clear because someone reading this would say well what's permanent what does that mean? The, the difficulty is, I'm, I'm gonna tell you this basically what happens have in your ordinance now. There's a discrepancy from, from two, um, two different sections of the ordinance as to whether or not you can locate something in the right yard. And this is an attempt to try and clarify that. When it comes to issues like permanent structures and things of that nature, there's always going to be a referral back to the state building code. 
So that would be something that the building official would have to do. I, I don't think it's appropriate to um, get more particular uh, in the zoning ordinance because that would run afoul with the state building code. So that's why I think you just see the words uh, uh, permanent self Folks at home, put it on wheels. There's nothing they'll be able to do if they pass this junk. Randy, please. Madam President. Yes. I, um, since there seem to be a number of concerns, and I have the same concern, honestly, that Councillor Edwards does about the size, um, especially when you're talking about, you know, the agricultural properties and things like that. Maybe we could note our concerns and send this to back to the planning board. I know they've done a lot of work, but for another look through and see if they couldn't um, address some of the concerns and then come back to us with it? Absolutely. Is that a motion? Uh, I'll make that a motion. Second. I have three seconds to that motion. Any further discussion? Trash the whole thing. Okay. We already know your opinion, Randy. Yeah, just making sure. All right. I'm sure it's clear. Um, the motion's been made and second. All those in favor? I was waiting. Okay. Excuse me. May I ask? You can, I okay. The yes, the public hearing is now closed. Um, public hearing date to be determined on Article uh, Four, Section Five H, Public Utility Uses, Section C. I'm at 6J, open recreation uses in Article 10, Section 3, park and storage, and use of major recreational equipment in residential districts. A, request from Michael, Attorney Michael Kelly to continue public hearing to March 12th. Request from Attorney in Andrew Tights to continue public hearing to March 26th. I guess both attorneys want to um, continue this, but they can't seem to come to a I conclusion on when. I, I think we have agreed yeah. on the March 26th date if the council would be willing to, to do that. Tony, any comment? No. All right. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion to continue this hearing until March 26th. So moved. Second. <laughs> any discussion from the council? A actually, I have a couple of things. Um, uh, two things one of which is that the solar ordinance is wrapped up in here which I don't think is in dispute or at least it's not in dispute for these folks I don't think um, and the planning board did a lot of work on it I do believe that there are other people who are waiting for this solar ordinance to be discussed <laughs> and potentially be approved so is there a way to disconnect the solar part of this so that it doesn't keep getting continued? Uh, actually, if I could address that, one of the changes that we were going to be making in our revised uh, proposed ordinance amendment would be to remove that section due to the solar ordinance. Remove I, what, what section? There was a, a section of the, of the original proposed ordinance amendment that mm -hmm. pertained to solar uses uh, in the R80 zone. What I'm suggesting is one of the revisions that we're going to be making to the amended version that is uh, going to be submitted shortly is to remove that portion of the proposed ordinance amendment. Okay. May, May I? I, from, I think I can could explain. Could you hang on just one second, please, Mr. Tights? Uh, could, I think I can you, answer your question. I, I know. Um, please. Okay. Let Councilor Hilton talk. <laughs> I, I realize that you have a solar piece, but my understanding is that the planning board, right, is this your solar piece or their solar piece that we've got in front of us? Maybe Susan, Susan. Maybe Susan can answer that for me. It's his. So it's his. this is yours. Okay. I, not, I not guess what me. I'm trying to find out is my understanding is the planning board has their own solar amendment. Yes? Okay. And that's so Susan, do you mind answering? I apologize for putting you on the spot. Councilor Hilton, if if, uh, if I could, I just I know in the minutes that we received from the planning board, yeah. um, they uh, the both uh, attorneys Kelly, Kelly and Tights um, addressed this specifically, and it was in there that the planning board uh, 
whatever they modified their recommendation to the council uh, had to deal with removing the solar part as well. So I just think we have outdated information in front of us. Right. Our entire solar ordinance is um, scheduled for a public hearing February 26th, the next council meeting. Okay. So and that was the public utility use section, the yes. first one. And so what I'm trying to make sure is the continuance that they're asking for is not going to hold up the public hearing on the planning board solar ordinance because no. I, there are other people who are waiting for that. It, it will not. Ours is separate. It okay. will not. It will not. It's a, se a separate, uh, separate matter. Okay. It will moot the proposal that uh, was put forward by the uh, applicant here. Okay. Right. So that answers one question that I have. The second question that I have <laughs> a little bit is that it, it, as I follow this along, at one point the applicant was going to go to the zoning board and then instead came forward with a zoning amendment and um, that went to the planning board uh, the plan the, the applicant determined that they didn't want to give the planning board the additional time it came to us we sent it back to the planning board and then I keep hearing that there's a new amendment that is coming is that correct that's correct so uh, but hang on a second but we haven't seen that new amendment yet that's correct okay and we keep having continuances and I think it's wonderful that the two attorneys that are, are working together but I have to say I'm getting a little concerned um, that this keeps sort of dragging on and dragging on and I'm especially concerned that you know there's a neighborhood that's now having to retain legal counsel because we don't seem to be able to address this in any sort of expeditious manner um, so while I understand you guys have agreed on a continuance, um, I also feel like th this has now been months and we don't seem to be getting to any place where we're getting this resolved. And as I said, I, you know, I do have a concern when, you know, neighbors feel that they have to hire attorneys and experts because <coughs> we don't seem to be able to get this sorted out. And meanwhile, um, and I know that a couple of counselors um, also was part of this, this weekend we got further complaints on our phone that there's further activity going there and on there, and now it's more than motocross. So are we just going to continue this forever and the property is going to be used for whatever they want to use it for? Well, I assume you're referring to uh, my client's property. I, I'm not aware of uh, what you're Well, we got phone calls to. this weekend regarding that property again. Uh, all I can say is regarding the, uh, the request to continue this matter, I believe that uh, we'll all be ready to go forward on March 26th. Um, we were told today, though. You were, and um, again, we asked for the continuance last time because of um, the amended letter from the planning board, the fact that we had not much notice um, when that was raised before the planning board. And then um, we asked for time to work with uh, the objecting of butters and their council to uh, work on a revised proposed ordinance amendment. Uh, we did uh, have that meeting. I emailed that uh, proposed version to attorney Tights last week. He's reviewing it uh, from my understanding with his clients. And then once we get his comments back, my intention was to send that to uh, Mr. DeSisto to review. And um, I know that. Uh, Council last time we were here had some concerns about whether or not it needed to be re-advertised. Well, to my concern board. doesn't need to go back to the planning board. Is is that a good concern if this is a totally different proposal? Well, as we discussed last right. time, it depends on how it many depends on what going to be made. Right. So this this may not even need to come in front of us right now. It needs to go back to the planning board if there's a big change in the first proposal that was in front of the planning board. is not changing other than the solar part that we discussed before uh, one of the, the changes really the, the major change would be to change it from a permitted use on properties of a certain size to a use permitted only by a special use permit so we would bring it under the zoning board's uh, review and to put in some performance standards for the zoning board to consider um, I don't think that because the use is not principally changing it would be uh, expeditious or beneficial to necessarily send it back to the planning board because then we're going to have to bring in all the experts and have a big hearing there and then come here and have the same hearing again 
and if we're trying to do this expeditiously, I think um, continuing it to the 26th, we're both available then, our experts are available, we can come in, have the big hearing, and uh, go from there, if the council's inclined. But if there's a big change, it, it's, it has to go back to the planning board, am I correct? If, yes, but if, I, I don't. I don't know if that's the case. I'm well, none of us know if that's yes. the case, and that's the problem. Um, we don't know if that's the case. Now, Mr. Tights, we haven't heard from you. Sure. Thank you, Andrew Tights, uh, representing several of the neighbors. Um, I first of all, I just want to talk about the continuance. I mean, I, I would be. I would have been happy to go forward here tonight. I, I'm available, and we'd be happy to have gotten it done. Did receive the request from Mr. Kelly both. In connection with talking about it and also um, although we had we met with him over a week ago so we still could have gone forward tonight um, however he requested it he had a witness that was unavailable um, and I am trying to be reasonably courteous about it and in fact I asked that it go actually one meeting further out because I've committed not even to another paying client but to a pro bono activity on the 12th of March um, so I do think we'll certainly look forward to getting this resolved on the 26th of March. In answer to your other question, having looked at what was sent to me, what was handed to me, and then a, a more recent red line version on Friday, um, I don't think the changes are substantive enough to warrant going back to the planning board. Obviously, that's Mr. DeSisto's call when he sees it, but it, it doesn't seem, and, and frankly, I. I'm not sure that we're going to come to any agreement because as he indicated the underlying use that they want to have on the property through this zoning thing isn't really changing so even though they've tweaked it some I don't think they're a substantive enough to go back to the planning board and probably not substantive enough unless we have a really surprising conversation later this week um, not substantive enough to change our opposition either so I would join in requesting the 26th subject to Mr. DeSisto's review. There's, there's enough time. All right, anyone from the council like to comment on this right now? At this point, it is an open hearing, a public hearing, am I correct? It's continued, but do you want me to continue it or do you want me to have? To the extent that there's gonna be a continuance, I think okay. that needs to be taken up. So no one in the audience that's here to speak on it can speak on it. All right, that's fine. Um, I like a motion to continue this matter. So moved. Second. Second. By the way, to just to March 26th. To March 26th. I probably won't be here for. Well, it's not all about us. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Motion's been made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Town Council sitting as a board of licensing. Chris G. and I can never say your name correctly. Petropolis. Oh, good. <laughs> General Auto Recycling, 384 King Road, Lot 602-113 and 602-112. Request Auto Junkyard <coughs> and Secondhand Dealer License to expire November 30th, 2018. Attorney DeSisto, any comments on this at all right now? No? Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, let uh, the uh, lawyer uh, okay. or the uh, applicant speak first, but I'll, I'll make some comments okay. after. Please introduce yourself. Can, I don't. Can we put the microphone on the table, please? We could. Yeah, just be if careful. You want, I could just, I'll could just stand here. No, it's, it's fine. Okay. We'll just move it. Yeah, sure. You want to be careful <laughs> that microphone, the little thing flies off. Anyway. Okay. We have other people that are going to sit there anyway. Sure. Uh, good evening. My name's Mitchell Edwards. I'm with the law firm of Hinkley Allen, and I represent the applicant, General Auto. <clears throat> as the uh, council uh, is aware, I believe is aware, um, at the uh, council's request and the agreement, we went to the zoning board to get a uh, use variance uh, for the property. Um, the zoning board granted uh, that variance, uh, and so we are now here per our discussions uh, to get the license uh, uh, renewed uh, for the two lots where the junkyard is on, lot 112 and lot uh, 113. Um, so I think uh, everyone is is up to speed on that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, Mr. Sisto, of course, uh, 
may have comments as well. So what lot, lots of these? <clears throat> the application. Yeah, I know. I just want to. unlock one of them. So oh, okay. it's, yeah. it's both lots 602-113 and 602-112. And the uh, use variance was granted for 112, which is uh, what we had discussed previously. But not the entire lot. Uh, just that just the, that portion that's being used, correct? Yeah, the the entire lot of 112 uh, that that is being used for the junkyard. Okay. And all of lot 112 is being used for the junkyard. That's okay. what I'm confused about. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Which yes. lot is being used? Lot one thirty. As the main one. Lot one thirty. We've talked a hundred lots yeah. with, on this. Lot, so. lot one thirteen and okay. lot one twelve. Are both being used for the junkyard. Um, we got a use variance for lot 112 to be continue to be used as a junkyard. We're not growing it beyond what it's being used. This, the was all, okay. this was all heard before the zoning board, uh, but we need uh, now to get the, the license for, for renewed for 112 and, and 113. That's correct. The point I was trying to make was this is not in granting this license. And in granting the license, and they did get uh, what they said they were going to get. You know, we were in court. This has been a long process. But this is not going to increase the size of the business. And, you're, and the license will reflect that, that it's just going to be the current operation and no expansion. Right. The, lot 112 has been used um, throughout this business, different parts of it. Yes. So, so it's going to continue to be used in the way it has been. We're not... We're not expanding the business, but that's, as a that's, result, I'm, I'm yeah. not saying it as artfully as you are. Yeah. And we have a nod from from the property owner. Yeah. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the council? This one goes to November 30th. Yeah, this goes to November 30th too. Yeah. And then you'll be back on the cycle. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Madam President. Yes. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, grant the auto junkyard and secondhand dealer license to expire November 30th, 2018 to General uh, Chris G Christos G. Petropolis, General Auto Recycling, 384 King Road, lot 602-113 and 602-112. Second. Second. And, and the, the uh, condition Second. conditions of meeting all legal requirements. But, but also that, the, uh, that the, the business shall not expand past its uh, current sure. limits on uh, both lots. Boundaries? Do you want to call it boundaries? boundaries? Oh, yeah. We're getting that. Add the boundaries Correct. in. All right. Correct. <laughs> it would be boundaries would be the word because that was the problem in the past. Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. So I have a motion and two seconds. Um, any discussion from the council? Motion to remain second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Appointments and resignations. Annual appointment of tree warning advertised John D. Manchester, 2970 Main Road, request reappointment. I don't see Mr. Manchester here, but he's been doing this since the beginning of time. Right? Appointment, and he was the only one who Yeah. Um, do I have a motion? Make a motion. We reappoint John Manchester. I'm going to second that, but I know Randy's recusing. Just want to point that out. I was wondering what you were doing. Um, okay, so motion's been made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Abstain. I want to abstain. Interviews for municipal court judges for candidates. The first one is Court B. Chappelle, Esquire. Yes, and, and just, just uh, for purposes of the record, to clarify, uh, Section uh, uh, 1011 of the uh, Charter, General, general Qualifications, uh, limits members of boards, commissions, um, or committees. They have to be electors for the town. Uh, this position um, has its own requirements that does not require uh, uh, the appointed uh, municipal court judge to be a resident of the town. Okay. Good evening. Um, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience, and why you 
uh, starting this position. All right. uh, I'll begin with my name is Court Chappelle. I've practiced law since 1985 and for the last 32 years have practiced mm -hmm. exclusively in Newport County. Uh, I joined a firm that I've had one job, to be honest with you, so it's not a long resume. <laughs> I joined my father's firm. Uh, I practiced mostly with my brother after I lost my father. And uh, recently, I'm proud to say, my son joined us in 2016. So we are pretty stable. We've been here a long time. And we are some of the last dinosaurs I consider general practitioners, which I think is important for you. Uh, we have clients, and we try to serve those clients. So we do real estate, and we do uh, criminal actions, maybe not murders and things, but certainly criminal stuff. Um, most of you know I also do a lot of zoning and planning. And when you look at the municipal court job, I think you have traffic, obviously, and, and the criminal ordinances, all of which I have been the person in my office kind of specializing in that for years. And you also have zoning, which I think is very important because your municipal court judge certainly needs to make sure that you attempt to solve those issues in the first instance. And when you can't, you put together a record that can be supported at the next level. Uh, and I do that for private clients, and I appeal them to the next level so I'm familiar with Superior Court. You know, rather than tell you why I want to be a judge, I guess I should tell you why I want to be that judge. And, and, and by that I mean, in the last 30 years we've all seen a lot of judges, or I've seen a lot of judges, and some of them are kind and wonderful people that may be a little inconsistent with the judicial uh, rules and regulations. So is kind as they are, they might not have always just decisions, because I think people need to rely on consistency. Uh, certainly Tony and I have seen some judges that are much less than kind, and the staff, uh, the clerks, the sheriffs, the litigants, the witnesses, nobody enjoys their experience there. But every once in a while there's that judge, and there's a judge that makes the experience pleasant for everyone and applies good judicial principles with consistency. And rather than sit back and complain about those who don't, I, in my opinion, do it right and give accolades that go to do those that do, I thought, uh, given the environment of the world of uh, people in charge that may be less gentlemanly and lady than I would like to see public officials, I uh, saw this opportunity to get involved. Thank you. Any questions from the council? Madam President. John. I actually have a question for Attorney DeSisto. Is it right if we ask them if they've ever sued the town? Yes. Okay. <laughs> have you ever sued the town of Tiverton before? I don't believe I have sued the town of cool. Tiverton. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say that uh, in experience, I have been the prosecutor for the town of Portsmouth on a couple of different stints, assistant solicitor back in the 90s, and then for the last 10 years prosecuted which certainly gives me the criminal background, I think, and the traffic background. Because we meet on Thursdays, I don't know if you're familiar with the district court, but uh, the district court has days, and Thursday is Tiburon and Portsmouth's day. So I sit aside alongside John Bernardo and your officers and know most of your officers personally, and I also think that may be a, a little bit of a benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Councilor Hilton? Um, yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Chappelle and, and maybe even Mr. DeSisto slightly a question because I do know that um, Mr. Chappelle has represented, I believe, clients um, on zoning issues in front of the town of Tiverton before. I certainly have, yes. And so, um, and, and this part's the question for Tony. Going forward, um, if someone were to be our judge, do they, can they continue to represent clients that may end up in front of the municipal court judge in zoning cases? Is that a co conflict? I mean, I, I realize you'd have your opinion on how you'd answer, handle the conflict, but I would like Tony's answer first. That's the okay. the, um, the, the uh, appeal from a, a, a zoning or planning case would not be to the municipal court. It'd be to Superior Court. So technically, um, the uh, part-time municipal court judge uh, could handle matters uh, in front of the, of the uh, uh, town boards and commissions, although I have to tell you that uh, my advice would be that, that that would not take place. I don't think it looks good. And I think Mr. Chappelle would agree with me on that. I, I think that's clear. In, in certain cases, we, when we have questions, we can actually take it in front of a disciplinary council and get opinions. But we are, my office obviously sat and had a conversation about whether or not to apply for this job. And I think that Quite frankly, you often get 
guys from Portsmouth applying for this, just like <coughs> Richard D'Addario was our municipal court judge, because so much of our practice is in our hometown of Portsmouth and lesser here that we couldn't take the position when it was open there because it would eliminate most of our livelihood. Here, although you've all seen me, it's not what I'd consider a high percentage of the work we do on a daily basis. So we made that decision that we could serve and not worry about losing the business that would be conflicted out. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? All right, thank you. No, thank you. Gerard Andrew Galvin. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Same um, questions. Uh, explain a little bit about yourself and why you would like this appointment. Okay, well first thank you for uh, having me here tonight. Uh, I have been a practicing attorney here in Rhode Island since 2005 uh, and have followed a somewhat similar career path to court. I don't have that much experience but uh, joined uh, my father's firm uh, in 2005 and I, I did leave that firm in July of 16 in order to take a different position with the city of Newport where I'm the assistant city solicitor for civil litigation right now. Um, prior to that, I was city solicitor for law enforcement in Newport for uh, the preceding eight years, where I handled the district court matters, uh, just as court does for Portsmouth, and also uh, uh, prosecuted municipal violations in Newport Municipal Court. So there's a great deal of experience there that I think would be uh, very relevant to, uh, to this position. Since uh, July of 16, I've, in my role as a uh, civil solicitor, I also handle the zoning board and so would be bringing that experience to the role of uh, municipal court judge as well. In terms of why I'm interested in the position, um, court alluded to this as well, but you know, these positions don't come open very often. And my feeling on it is, is uh, as attorneys, we uh, get up and go to work every day in court and we're advocating hard for one side for our clients and I find it very important to find aspects of the law where I'm not always advocating but can find a position where uh, it's just about applying the law about justice about you know what's right and so the position of prosecutor for eight years was great I loved it because your role in that position is, is justice. Uh, obviously, municipal court judge, that's the focus. It's applying the law. It's not taking one side or the other. It's listening to both sides and getting it right. And my uh, philosophy is to try to have a position always in my career where that's the role I'm playing. So that's why I'm applying to this opening. Um, I do have, I don't know if the council's interested in I don't know what you're um, if you're voting tonight but I did bring a a little summary of the Newport Municipal Court um, numbers of cases and, and things you know how we handled it in case you're interested in looking at over the eight years that I was there if you'd like to accept that I'm happy to give it to you if not I totally understand but I, I have that for your review if you're interested in it you can give it to the clerk okay. and she'll pass it out to us Will we be making a decision tonight, or do we have to wait because these are all new applicants? Does this is still um, part of the the way that we appoint? These are all new applicants that will have a time. Is this different? It's it's the, mm -hmm. Nancy's no, correct. She had just said to me that that applies to your boards and commissions, That's what but. I'm you're not required to make a decision tonight. It depends on if you're comfortable and whether or not you want to make it. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions if, if there are any. Any uh, questions from the council? Madam President, I'm in the interest of asking the same question, have you ever sued the tenant evidence? I don't believe I have. <coughs> uh, I was racking my brain, but I don't think I've ever been involved in litigation against Tiverton. Okay. Oh, I grabbed two. Thank you. Okay. 
Any other questions from the council? Have you uh, represented um, any of the um, residents of the town? Uh, yes. Um, I have. I didn't do Just in a, general. Yes, I have. <laughs> That's specific. I have. You know, no, I have had uh, clients uh, from Tiverton in Superior Court, also in District Court. And um, I don't believe I've been out here seeking zoning relief or in front of the planning board. Uh, but I have had occasion to represent Tiverton residents in um, in Superior and District Court. Thank you. Any other thank questions? You. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Robin H. Humphrey. Oh, there you are. I'm <laughs> um, same thing, Attorney Humphrey. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're seeking this position. Okay. Um, Madam President, members of the Council, good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me address you today. Um, I had the honor of serving as the Municipal Court Judge in the past, and with the help of the Town Clerk and the Acting Chief Jones, we were able to bring the court into compliance with the rules and procedures of the Rhode Island uh, Traffic Tribunal. By doing that, we were able to implement procedures that allowed us to eliminate the five to six month backlog of cases that existed. Also, we were able to bring the uh, overtime for the police officers uh, down because when I first started, we had five, six, seven police officers here waiting uh, for their cases to be called. But by implementing the procedures used in the district court and the traffic tribunal, um, Acting Chief Jones became the prosecuting officer that handled all arraignments. So instead of having these five or six or seven officers here uh, that we we're paying overtime for, um, we were able to get them back on the street. And I can tell you with the municipal court, most of the cases are traffic cases. Uh, and of those cases, 90% are resolved right at the arraignment. Uh, so it really did help us move things efficiently through the court. Um, also, reason I'd, I'd like an opportunity to be the municipal court judge again is I've always seen the court uh, as primary purpose is to be a valuable asset for the citizens of the town to help generate revenues over and above the cost of the court uh, to help bring down some of the tax burden um, also to ensure the fair administration of justice so that everyone who comes before the court knows uh, they're going to get their day in court and I can tell you having both been a municipal court judge and for 22 years being a Newport County Bail Commissioner acting as a neutral magistrate. Most people, if you give them the opportunity to tell their side of the story and listen to them honestly, even if you rule against them, they say, okay, I, I can deal with that because they understand the way our system of justice works. And they just wanted their day in court. Any questions from the council? Same question as the others. <laughs> I have never sued the town of Tipperton. Yes. Mr. Humphrey, it, you know, you definitely, your resume shows a good amount of experience with municipal and traffic and criminal. Do you have any, since our municipal court also hears zoning disputes, what can you tell us about what your zoning experience is? Okay. For 14 years, I um, worked with the Little Compton Zoning Board of Review, sat at their meetings, prepared their decisions, and, and defended those decisions in Superior Court when necessary. Uh, since that time, I've had numerous private clients, and I've appeared in before pretty much most zoning um, um, boards throughout the state because I did some telecommunications work for a while where we needed to go everywhere. And, and so the follow-up to that, the same question would be in this position you would um, not represent then applicants in, if you were to receive this position in front of our zoning or planning boards? I, I would not, and that would not be a hardship for me because I really am more primarily uh, a criminal defense attorney. Uh, although I do zoning and I do enjoy it, it's not something that I really would come for the Tiverton Zoning Board with any frequency anyways. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Uh, just the same question, have you represented um, residents of Tiverton? Uh, I've, I've represented, uh, re uh, represented uh, Tiverton residents um, extensively in all the courts throughout the state uh, because 
I do criminal work, uh, and sometimes civilly, I've represented them as well. But in both Rhode Island and Mass, I've represented them in court. Uh, not on any zoning issues. Um, no, I really don't. I really don't have much experience doing zoning cases in, in front of Tiverton uh, Zoning Board. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, Attorney Hopkins. Oh, thank you very much. John A. Paglini. Good evening, Madam President, Council Members. Welcome. Thank you. Attorney Paglini. Um, the same thing, tell us about yourself and why you are seeking this position. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Paglarini. I am a resident of the town of Tiverton. Um, I have been practicing law since 2000. It was a second career prior to that. I was a town tax assessor for eight years, and I was the town planner slash administrative officer for the town of West Greenwich. The majority of my client base overwhelmingly is still in Kent County even though my office has been located in Newport County all my clients are over on the other side um, I'm in a unique position before you today because last week I was appointed uh, parliamentarian of the state senate and what that necessitated was I cleared the decks I eliminated all my night clients so I can no longer do zoning work, planning work, et cetera, because I'm not available. As the session gets later and later, I can't run to a meeting at 7 o'clock and be there. So currently, I have no ongoing projects in the town of Tiverton. I have represented uh, persons in front of the zoning board previously, uh, albeit a few. Um, my take on the municipal court uh, judgeship is a little bit different in that the traffic takes care of itself. I don't see it as a revenue generating position. Um, these are our neighbors. A lot of the persons that come before the municipal court are not criminals. They are residents of the town of Tiverton for the most part. And th again, I'll agree with what was previously said. They want, they want their fair hearing. And I believe I can uh, administer that on behalf of the town. As far as um, other matters, I think I am well versed, having been a full-time town employee for nearly 10 years and a town hall lawyer for nearly the last 20, when we start getting in issues of such as Section uh, 1211 of the Charter where a complaint is brought against this council. I believe that I have the breadth of understanding as your judge to understand really anything that's come before you because for the last 20 years I've sat at council meetings as an attorney and 10 years prior to that as a town department head. So I think I would be well versed if somebody was to file a charter complaint against this council to understand any matter that's brought before you. Well, I am, uh, thank you. Any questions from the council? <coughs> Interestingly, I can answer yes to that question. All right. <laughs> um, I, I do, the primary part of my law practice is property tax appeal work. Okay. And I can say that I did sue Mr. Robert in his capacity as tax assessor on behalf of a client. But nobody else that I can recollect. Did you win? There is no winning when you litigate. <laughs> you have to, if you get to the courthouse, you've already lost. So I'll take that. You're not going to answer me. <laughs> um, any other questions from the council? I think he's already answered mine. He does has okay. represented. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, you for your time. Um, so the question I have for the council would you like to make this decision tonight? I'll put it off until the next Madam President, um, I think we've got four really qualified candidates, and, and it would be remiss if I didn't feel like I had to sleep on this, um, because I think that any one of the four, any one of the four would be a, a great choice. So, any comments from anyone else? 
Madam President, yes. I would prefer to put it off just to look at the yeah. just to look at the stuff because it they they may and be good, but I haven't them. seen them. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read all of the stuff and look. Yeah, I would just prefer to think about it. But all right, so I need a motion to continue this to the March twelfth meeting. So moved. You don't want to continue you want March twelfth, or you want February twenty? Oh, I'm sorry, Fe the February one. Yeah. I'm very sorry. So moved. You think everyone's mentioned? Yeah. Are we going to make a decision that we're not going to kick the can any yes. further we're than that? We're going to make a decision on the 12th. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 26. The uh, 26. 26. Right. The I'll make it right now, but I'll go along with the rest of you. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Thank you, Jevin. Thank you, guys. Um, I see that the school committee has arrived but I'm just going to finish up what I'm doing right this moment uh, personnel board Laurie Robinson 35 Campion Avenue Tiverton is Laurie here no I'm not sure we called her to remind her all right so we'll continue this until we can meet Laurie we okay. next meeting. So I have a motion to continue mm -hmm. this to the next meeting so moved second motion for made and second all those in favor Talk finances. So let's talk finances. Open public forum announcement, comments, questions, and presentation. Presentation on Tibbet and Annual Financial Report ending June 30th, 2017. I see that he's here. <coughs> Councilor Hilton, yours yeah, underneath. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, because I Cecil took the lines. So now I have my own. Yeah, I have two. I have a line here. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> Hello, everybody. Do you introduce yourself. I don't know if everyone knows who you are. Absolutely. My name is Kyle Connors, and I'm from your auditors, Haig Sahadi and Company. And hopefully, you all have in front of you uh, the financial statements for June 30, 2017. I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, more important areas that I think are. Uh, the council would want to focus on and if you have any questions along the way don't hesitate to ask I'm happy to answer to the best of my ability <coughs> um, so we'll start right at the very beginning uh, page one page one is our audit report if you were to read through this audit report you would see that we noted that we did not have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies as it relates to the audit adjustments that we made throughout um, our audit process and Really what that is is a testament to your finance team here with the town. Um, Denise and, and the finance team here do a wonderful job. And uh, we had a very smooth audit this year. One thing I do want to point out um, that I meant to point out before we even got started is that this is not a final copy of the draft. We are um, going back and forth with the actuary with regard to some disclosure in the back of the financial statements as it relates to your OPEP plan. None of the numbers in here are going to change. What may change is some of the notes and some of the RSI. Um, nothing that I think is going to be too uh, well, significant and, and certainly won't affect the outcome of the audit, but I, I want to make sure that you're aware that this is just a draft. Um, we intend to have the, the final... The numbers themselves won't be changing. The numbers themselves will not be changing. That's correct. The government-wide financial statements start on pages 18 and 19. And looking at page 19, there's a couple of liabilities that are on the books that I think are uh, the most important to bring to your attention. The first of which is the other post-employment benefit obligation, which sits at a little over $8.1 million. Next year, GASB statement number 75 is going to be implemented. Um, it's required to be implemented. And what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to take your post-employment benefit obligation off the book and put the liability on. The difference between the two is the obligation is what you should have been paying along to have a funded plan versus what the liability is, which is if everyone who's eligible for benefits re retires all at the same time, um, that's what you'd owe out. Had that been implemented in FY17, that number would have jumped from 8.1 to about 27.5 million. Is it realistic that everyone's going to retire at the same time and you're going to have to hand out 27.5 million dollars? It's not realistic. but. Um, the GASBs want to, want to show the OPEB liability the same as they show their pension liability, which is grossed up the full amount. 
As of June 30, 17, that OPEB plan is funded at 1.2%. Um, the majority of the municipalities that we work with treated other post-employment benefits as pay as you go, um, pay, pay for the costs as, as they come up. Very limited amount of them had started up um, OPEB trust fund. So that's new for the town this year is the, the OPEB trust. Although I think there, there may have been some assets allocated in the prior year with a very limited amount. So 1.2% is low. Most of the municipalities we work with are under 10%. So it's pretty um, comparable to what we're seeing. Um, and I'm sure that there's a plan in place to get that number to be funded higher than. Madam President, if I, if I could, I just want to make sure because I'm sure people are going to watch and hear that and I don't want people at home to think okay well we're you know we're like everybody else like we're gonna be okay that actuarial number jumps up significantly over time and so it's uh, you know maybe today we're like the other municipalities that haven't paid attention to this but we sh certainly as a as a board we should make it a policy to continue to be like them and ignore it so just want to make sure I, I put that out there for the record <laughs> absolutely <laughs> uh, the liability right below that is your net pension liability um, the gross step number is 30, just under 33 million. Majority of that liability is with state plans, with your teacher plans and your municip municipal plans. Um, only about f just under 6 million, about $5.9 million of that is your private plan. So the remaining uh, dollars, if you wanted to pay them down and have your state pension plan uh, funded at higher and show a lower liability, the state isn't gonna allow you to do that. So essentially at the end of the year, they tell you what your number is uh, for your liability and that goes on your books. However, you do have control over your private plan. And a couple of things that are important. Um, it, it is at 5.9 million, uh, which is up about $180,000 from the prior year. However, um, it is currently funded, or at least as of June 30, 2017, it was funded at uh, 65 and a quarter percent, which is about two and a half percent higher than the prior year. So you saw two and a half percent growth over the course of fiscal 17. Um, that's in part um, due to the economy uh, having a much better impact on your um, actuarial assets and also you overfunded your ARC by 90 grand this year too. Two really um, big assumptions drive that liability. The first of which is the discount rate, which is what you expect your assets to work at over the course of a year, which you have currently set at 7.5%. 7.5% 7 um, 7 is consistent with what the state uses in, in their plan, so um, consistent with regard to that. However, the mortality tables that you're using um, are much more up to date. You're using tables um, f scaled to 2016, and whereas the state's using uh, tables that are scaled to the year 2000. What we've seen is anytime there's a sizable jump, you know, five, 10 years in, in those tables, you're gonna see a huge impact on your liability. Um, I wouldn't foresee that being the case with your, with your private plan, uh, as it's very up to date. I have a question for you on that one. Yep. Um, up until recently, we hadn't included some types of pay in what the pensionable assets were. So is that factored in all avenues of pay factored into what we have here? Or is this just reflecting the prior year before it was implemented? As far as I know, it's everything. Okay. But I, I'm, I could probably do some research for you. If yeah, you and there was a recent change. I think it, ha it would have happened after uh, the end of fiscal year 17. So, Okay. Maybe I'd have to look into that for you. Okay. Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> We're all guilty of that sometimes. Keep it up, I'll call you again. <laughs> <laughs> um, when a bond rating agency comes in to look at your financial statements, they may not focus on your government wide so much as they're going to focus on your um, governmental funds. And those financial statements start on page 22 and 23. If you were to look at the bottom of page 22, what you'd see is uh, you have fund balance of 32.7 million. And what I always want to make sure that the council and, and everyone understands is that the town doesn't have 30, almost $33 million of cash hanging out that you can do as you please with. Um, what we break out, and this is quite a bit later into the financial statements, but I think it's relevant now to talk about, is on page 82. On page 82, we break out the intended uses of that fund balance. So you can see, um, as it relates to capital projects, while total capital projects does have $23 million worth of fund balance, it's already committed to uh, various school projects, uh, various public works programs. The number in the general fund that you're seeing the, uh, under committed to public works programs, the 283,000, that reflects the library that was sold um, that is being held for specific uses as it relates to uh, your public works programs. So we wanted to make sure that you were aware of 
um, what that what that figure represented. I believe there were intended uses for it, and it wasn't intended to be put into the operating budget. Um, so no, that's it's not. That's why it's broken out there that's for you. So overall, in your, in your general fund, you have unassigned fund balance of just under $2 million. Under $2 million? One point, uh, one point nine, sorry. Okay. Oh. I got my nine and my eight mixed up. <laughs> um, going back to page 23, this is uh, the income statement for your governmental funds. The general fund had a surplus of $850,000. The school unrestricted fund had a surplus of $935,000, and your non-major governmental funds had a surplus of $16.2 million. Uh, the $16.2 million is a little bit inflated in the sense that uh, you did have proceeds from your bond issuance of $15.4 million, but the intention is to use that bonding to cover capital projects to spend that down. So I assume over the course of the next two years, you're going to see that come back down to, down to reality as, as you um, spend that money. So our surplus was? 800 you said? 851,000 in, in the general fund. But some of that was restricted? Yes, correct. Yep, some actually a good a good portion of that. So the right. if you look about four lines above that sale of town property, that's the library. That right. 389,000 was restricted. That's correct. Okay. And the school has what um had a surplus of Correct. Um it, we can go to it now if you want to uh as, as it relates to the general fund and the school and restricted fund, but we provide a budget and actual in the set of financial statements, and I think that might paint the best picture for everyone as you're, as you're reviewing it. So the general fund starts on page 85. So pages 85 and 86 are the budget and actual for the general fund. Um, you're going to see that general tax property revenue came in about $100,000 under budget. Um, as it relates, compares to 38 million, um, not a huge variance, but it was under what was anticipated. There were uh, quite a bit of revenues generated under licenses, permits, and usage fees. Um, there were development projects, I'm sure you're aware of, that occurred in FY17, um, and that led to uh, significantly higher um, licenses than were anticipated. Overall, there was no real uh, significant variance as it relates to your expenditures, um, but you'll see on page 86, that sale of uh, the library had a profound impact on your on your bottom line. Um, so without that, you're probably looking at, you know, off the top of my head, on a four four hundred and seventy thousand dollars worth of surplus, as opposed to the eight hundred and fifty one that you showed. The school department, the school unrestricted fund on and the some of that surplus is restricted accounts that we can only spend for such as paving. So if we didn't do the home paving project, it would go into the general fund. Well, no, it would be restricted. Restricted, restricted, restricted. for the general fund. And you can see that on so the that final column, there. okay. um, there's about $50,000 worth of money that is being carried into fiscal 18 okay. that's restricted for paving. That's correct. Madam President, is that, where, um, is that where some of the FEMA money would fall? Like if we get reimbursements from the Fed for some sort of, you know, something from years prior, that would be part of that number as well? Please could answer that. I don't think so. So the same year goes to the, the same account, but let's say this, you know, we're looking at fiscal year 17 here. If we had a reimbursement from fiscal year 16, it would show up in that 851,000 number. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Uh, the school unrestricted fund is the budget and actual is on page 87, so just the following page. A um, couple of areas stand out as being notable variances, either favorable or unfavorable. As it relates to the revenues, uh, there was $505,000 worth of other revenue um, that was unbudgeted. A portion of that, uh, about $190,000, was a <coughs> credit back from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, I believe. And that money was subsequently transferred to your fiduciary or to the school's fiduciary uh, trust fund for their OPEP plan. Um, so that was a net zero transaction. The remaining amount was uh, Medicaid that um, was, was not budgeted for a, a little over $300,000 in revenue. Um, below that, under your expenditures, uh, there was unanticipated uh, hires throughout the year. I think uh, it's difficult not just for the school department in Tiverton, but certainly each school department that we work with to monitor and manage their 
um, their special education costs because uh, sometimes it's less expensive to keep costs in-house, so you might want to spend more on salaries. As you place more students out of district, it, it, it comes with a premium. You pay a significantly higher amount. So a lot, of a lot of times we see fluctuations between salaries and purchase services just based on um, the needs of the children and their, their IEPs and what the, the town has to offer. And that's really the driving force in the school unrestricted fund this year. Uh, you can see that salaries were over budget by about 806000 whereas purchase services were well under uh, what was anticipated by a one, about $1.3 million, a little, a little over that. Um, both of those lines are, are really driven by the special education uh, program. There was also technical equipment purchased um, in FY, uh, FY17 that was not originally anticipated in the budget. Um, majority of that was due to the fact that there was going to be a surplus and them needing sp specific uh, items related to the school department to be purchased for capital, um, capital reasons. Uh, below that, there was a transfer to other funds uh, that was unbudgeted for. About 45,000 of that, or exactly 45,000 of that went to the school lunch fund, and 117,000 of that was housing aid that was required to be transferred to a, a special revenue fund. Ultimately, that led to an increase in the, the school unrestricted funds fund balance of 935,000. So they put 935,000 in the bank this year. In their, unre in, in their re unrestricted account. Yeah, we, we don't present their fund balance as being unrestricted because it's restricted for purposes right. so of the in school. Their restricted account. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to backtrack a bit because I want to show you a couple of things. Uh, if we could jump to page 42. Each year we're required to um, review the, le the town's legal debt margin to determine whether or not you're under your debt margin. Um, at June 30, 2017, you were under your debt margin. Excuse me, under your debt margin by a little over sixteen point eight million dollars. So, on page forty-seven, it's a breakout of your long-term debt. Um, nothing that we haven't really gone over already, other than the fact that there was uh, re a refunding that occurred in fiscal year seventeen, which resulted in a gain on that refunding of about one point three six million. Um, and you'll see the sizable addition to your bond payable that I'm sure you were already aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, page 54 I wanted to bring to your attention real quick. You have your discount rate set for your pension assets at 7.5%. Um, right now you have your discount rate set for your OPEB, excuse me, OPEB assets at 3.5%. Uh, so really it's the, whatever approach the town feels uh, they want to mm -hmm. take. Three and a half, if, if you're going to invest them similar to your pension assets, three and a half might be a little bit low. Um, if you're going to treat them differently, then you know that's ultimately your, your decision. Uh, but you can see what a drastic impact just 1% change in your discount rate has on that total liability, whether it's higher or lower. Um, you know, a little over three and a half million dollars if you, if you change the percent by you know, just one. So one point might seem small, but it has a pretty profound effect. And you can see the same thing on page 79 as it relates to your uh, private pension plan, which you currently have discount rate at 7.5% on the bottom of that page. Um, you know, one way or the other, if your assets under or overperform, that's the liability that you're looking at for your private plans. Out of curiosity on this one, I see you guys, you know, show the 1% increase, 1% decrease. Um, I mean, with all the stuff that's happened over the last, you know, just a couple of weeks here in the market, I know our pension's probably getting hammered right now. So is there any way to, do, are you we not required to show anything lower than that? Oh, you, you can set that. That's ultimately, I, I think, believe you have a pension. A but pension I mean, board. as far as this report goes, because I, I think that that might be. This, that was set, that was set in stone with your, um, with your actuary. Yeah, I know the seven and a half is, but I mean, so you show what a 1% decrease and what a 1% increase looks like. Yep. But, you know, it might be helpful to take a look at because the market is so volatile and the way our assets are allocated is fairly aggressive. Okay. I mean, we could realize a, you know, overall return of 2% or we could hit 11%, which, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were hitting 
good double digit numbers up until very recently. So um, it's certainly worth looking into. It's not my area of expertise right. so much. We do rely on the actuaries as it relates to that. Um, but you know, if your if your assets come in over, you know at two percent as opposed to seven and a half percent, the way that the Gatsby has have it set up is you don't you don't have that impact all in one year. Mm -hmm. So they smooth that either, you know, it could go the other way too, that they're gonna smooth the gain or a loss over the course of five years. Okay. So you're not gonna see your liability, you know, constantly fluctuate. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think seven and a half is too high. I don't know if the rest of the council thinks, but that's what the state has us doing, so. Okay. Um, the remaining remainder of the port, uh, report is uh, sort of details and, and things we've already gone over, but I do want to point out one area in the back of the financial statement starting on page 150. This is the annual supplementary, excuse me, annual supplemental transparency portal, um, as the state calls their MTP program. And what this report is going to do is it's going to take all of the municipalities and school districts within the state of Rhode Island and I'll put them into a transparency portal and allow you to determine uh, you know how much did um, did Woonsocket spend on their school department versus um, you know Little Compton which I know they're two varying uh, sized entities I don't know why those two came to my head um, or Cumberland versus Lincoln you know two similar size and they're gonna allow you to see exactly how much uh, what percent of, of funding was spent in each area um, this is the second phase so only about half the state or a little over half the state at this point has implemented the MTP report. Um, Tiverton was part of the second phase and uh, it's been a challenging process because the state is looking at very, um, I don't want to say small items, but they're really making sure that the reporting is done um, correctly at, even at a very small dollar basis. So um, it was a little bit of a struggle this year, not specifically here with Tiverton, but just really all around. But overall, I think it's improved the financial reporting, um, which is important. But it is good to know that you're part of the second phase and that you were able to include them in your financial statements. So that's basically what I have for financial statements. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. I do have another report, um, single audit report that I can get into. But um, you know, while we're on the topic of the financial statements, it might be best to wait on that. Any questions from the council at this point? I did have one more. I gotta find it. I actually read this thing, by the way. <laughs> it was in here somewhere. I'm probably not gonna. Was find it a good read? It. Oh, it was. It, I mean, you guys do a good job at putting it together. It makes. I mean, if you read all the details and stuff, it's easy to understand what's going on. So. No, I'm happy to hear that. I know sometimes when you take a look at these things. I think what I had. Well, the only question I had. I just want to point out to the rest of the council because there's a chart in here somewhere that I saw um, that talks specifically about. Um, the asset lifespans and depreciation in that section. It was like vehicles are yep. five years and then yep. other items all the way down to buildings yep. are 40. Um, Page 36. Yeah, I know you'd know where it was at. There it is. Yeah, like trucks are eight, equipment's 10, heavy equipment's 25. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we point out those typical lifespans for things because in this town we seem to take, you know, trucks with an eight-year lifespan and run them for 35 years. So just wanted to... Get that one no. on record too. <laughs> Not here. Fair enough. Yeah. But I, but as it. as it pertains to the depreciation, I did notice that we have what uh, like it's like four point seven million dollars in land that we're not depreciating, and then there's a bunch of other stuff that we depreciate in that category. Can you give some details on that. Absolutely. So I believe you're referencing page forty six. Yeah, that's it. Uh, under GAP purpose, the uh, no, GAP framework, we're not allowed to depreciate your land or construction in progress. Um, it's just held as non-depreciable assets, um, in the sense that you could, you know, develop them or uh, sell them. Now, if that piece of land it becomes impaired and it's not worth what we have on the books, that's a time where we could adjust it to a lower or or, or a higher um, level. So it might be worth going through those uh, land parcels and you know having at least that discussion to see okay. if it's truly what they're worth and those are and those those are rates that are set here by our assessor right correct okay. typically it would be the um, well the, what's on the books is the purchase price okay uh, for that land so there may be a difference between the assessed value of that land and what it was purchased for especially if it was purchased you know quite quite a few years ago yeah so like this property that we're at now where you know town of Tiverton's owned it for decades would it be beneficial to reassess that property 
Potentially. Okay. Should. Uh, barring no other questions, I'll get into the single audit report for you. Um, I don't know if you have that in front of you. We just finalized it, I think, today. Today. Um, but but it, th this is going to run through um, two different things. The first is it's going to uh, talk about your day-to-day -day controls as it relates to your cash receipts, cash disbursements, payroll, um, your tax revenue when that money comes in. And what we do is we select different areas each year and we make sure that um, there's multiple sign-offs, that there's not the, uh, uh, there's a, a limited amount of potential for, um, for fraud. Uh, so reading through this report, you'd see that we don't have any instances of internal control issues to bring to your attention where um, there's potential for theft or fraud. I mean, while that, that can always exist through collusion or through a whole manner of things, nothing was brought to our attention that we'd want to talk to you about. However, um, so what this, the, the second part of this report does is it talks about your federal dollars. Um, we have a copy of that that we, oh. no, we don't draw. For the council, that's what I mean. Hmm? Has this all gone to the order to general? No. It has not. No. Not yet. So no. Correct. I don't anticipate there being any changes in the single audit report. He's telling us we're okay. I mean, would the council like like a copy of what we're talking about? Right eventually, this will be in the final, it. right? Yeah. I can pass it around. No, if you, we're okay. eventually going to get okay. it, I'm fine. Go I'll ahead. take your word for it. Okay. So you Go seem ahead. like a trustworthy guy. Thanks. Yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anytime an uh, entity has over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of federal money um, passed through, we are required to perform a single audit. In FY17, you had $1.45 million worth of federal dollars. Um, and we selected two programs to test. Uh, your Title IIb Math and Science program, which had about 200, almost $230,000 worth of expenses, and your Special Education, which had about $493,000 worth of expenses. And what we do um, for each program that we pick as major, we test to make sure that the costs that they're using that money on are allowable per the federal guidelines that they're reported uh, to the state and to the federal government correctly that they're used in the period in which they're required to be. And if we had any non-compliance, this is an area where we would include that. Um, there is one finding that I would want to bring to your attention as it relates to the special education program. So basically what the uh, federal guidelines require is that you draw down um, your federal funding in a timely manner. And that's on both ends. So uh, they don't want you to draw down the money, you know, all, all of your sped money at the beginning of the year and then spend the next nine months spending it down. Um, they want you to do it on an as-needed basis. And the same is true if you uh, have a, uh, you know, all of your expenditures and then you draw down once at the end of the year. Um, they don't want to see that either because they want to make sure that they are uh, monitoring your cash needs as they're happening. So what happened was um, all of the special education money was drawn down in January of 2018. Um, as it related back to June 30, 2017. So there was a timeliness issue between when that money was spent, the eligible costs were spent, and when the money was drawn down from the state. So that's what this finding is included in here. Um, we've provided that finding to the uh, school department, to Elisa. I don't know if you've had a chance to work with uh, Elisa far yet, uh, but she's reviewed it. And they did provide a response as they're uh, required to, so I can read that to you if you want. Uh, due to the turnover of the director of finance position, the drawdown of federal funds was delayed. The action plan going forward is to review the federal IDEA Part B, which is the SPED fund, uh, regularly and draw down funds in a timely fashion. Now, these funds were from two years, two consecutive years, or just one? This year? is just fiscal seventeen dollars. Okay. Yep. And how much was that? Uh, four hundred and one thousand. And so that went into their account now. Correct. That went into their, their they have a um, special revenue fund for their SPED IDEA funds. It's not part of the school unrestricted fund, but the revenue came into the, the special revenue and then the eligible expenditures were transferred out of the school unrestricted fund and into your special revenue fund. No problem. <laughs> Let me find it. Uh, so the money uh, was originally expensed in the school unrestricted fund. The money was then drawn down in January and came into your special revenue fund and those expenses, which were originally posted to the school and restricted fund, were moved to your special revenue fund. So in 400 went into... But they were eligible expenses okay. um, per... I got you. The, the state allowed them and then we right, did so our testing as well. 
went into the accounts where the general fund was supplementing that at that time. Correct. And so then all that money went into the unrestricted, which you don't like to call, but in their fund. Correct. Yep. Okay. So if you were to look, um, actually, you if you were looking to, okay. <laughs> if you want to go back to the financial statement, I can probably show you exactly where that where that is too. Is there going to be any issue liability-wise for the school department because of that? Or do we get a free pass this time? A free pass. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't foresee there being any further um, issues. But it did add to their, their, I call it their unrestricted account, their reserve account. Fund balance. Their fund balance. That's the, best, the way to put it. So that money went into their fund balance. Uh, Not the special ed money, but the money that they spent for those needs. Yes, correct. Right. Went into because they yeah, because they no longer spent that because they were reimbursed with their special ed money. Correct. I that's it. correct. Okay. Yeah, and that's on, and that's um, on page one forty two. You can see um, it's a net zero transaction with regard to the revenue and the um, expenditures on page one forty. You can see the four eighty nets out, but four hundred one out of that four eighty was moved from the school and restricted fund to the so it did increase what they have in there correct yep so right now what do we yeah go ahead uh, of those federal funds is that the allocation for the year or is that that was only the allocation through january or is that was the allocation for the full year of fiscal year 17. In the general fund, you said how much do we have right now? It's like three point something. Three point eight. How much of fund balance? Yeah, it's three point eight. For the town of Tiverton. For the town of Tiverton. But that was as of the fiscal year seventeen end. Yeah. Okay. Versus the school department at four. John's four answering this for you. <laughs> I'm interested. <That's> okay. <laughs> say it again. John, say it again. could you say it again? How much was it? It's like three point eight million that we've got. No, uh, I'm page. I, I don't mean to, no, to it's tell 3. you. Three, right? It's three point three. 3. Yeah. yeah. 3. See, you got the eights and nines confused. I got the threes and the eights confused. <laughs> uh, it's three point three million. Yep, three point three seven one as of June thirty seventeen. Yeah, that is. And um, they're at four. You know, like I said, that's not all unassigned money. There's right. You know, we, we break that down categorically. You know, one point eight nine eight of that is unassigned fund balance. So I get, I got a question about that. Um, I'm confused about that. The unassigned fund balance is one point nine. Okay. So, and I, again, I probably read this earlier, but when we have to do uh, that three percent that we have to have, that's what's confusing me. Yeah, is that is that one point eight whatever that we've actually got unassigned? That's the three percent number. Correct. All right, because okay. I did that's see that in here. That's my question. So right. the one point eight. And not the full amount, right? Okay. Yep. Okay. Correct. Okay. There's a section in here on Any that. other questions? I mean, I don't have any questions, but. Actually, I do have one more question. So, so when we see that, uh, when we see that 3.3, you know, some of that's assigned, some of that's unassigned for the town. Out of that 4.429 for the school department, is there some of that assigned versus unassigned like the town, or is that just straight up unassigned? Straight up, I think, right. Let me just double check that before I give you a right or wrong answer. Okay. Jerry's looking at um, me, but I'll explain it. Like, we have money that just has to be spent on paving right, and that right, kind right, of right, thing. Right. So, so there's about $1.66 million represents um, a portion of that that's committed for capital projects, and $2.767 million is your day-to-day -day operations. So technically so Jerry, speaking, the they've got more money than we do in the school department. Yeah, I'm confused because I didn't know about that. The fund balance in the school department is higher. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. So when did like you the free cash flow one. But the 1.6 right. you have just for capital? Oh, yeah, I would agree. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, so there's 1.6 that has been committed to vary in, you know, over the last 18 okay. months. Okay. I, would say, I remember that. Okay. committed to various capital projects. All of our capital over the last six years has come out of our fund balance every time. Okay. Right. Now, I know that the Budget Committee Chairman is looking at me like he'd like to ask a question. If anybody has any objections, I think it's appropriate. 
Cecil. Oh, come on up. Because you won't, I don't know if you'll be hearing this. This is Cecil Leonard, the head of our budget committee. Well, yes. temporary head, he, he comes and goes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to go. He's trying, he's trying to leave too. But he's not succeeding. Keep <laughs> We're trying trying to keep nobody him. wants it. <laughs> I just, uh, you went through an awful lot of data very quickly, and I've just got a couple questions Absolutely. for you and also one for Mrs. Surratt. Now, if I followed everything right, the unassigned fund balance for the municipality other than the school district is $1,898,325. Is that correct? That's correct as it relates to your to the general fund. Yes. Any other and funds, if there are funds in your non-major funds that um, run a deficit, so right now there's about almost a hundred, little over $100,000 worth of individual funds that are showing a deficit, we're required to call that unassigned balance per GASB 54, but you're correct in saying that in your general fund you have unassigned fund balance of 1.898 million. Now, wherever Mrs. Surrett went to, um, that 1898.325 represents 3.9% of the total general fund expenditures. So we really only have 0.9 over our 3% cap. Correct. Have I got that right? Okay, yes, because yes, okay. that's, that's why I was asking that question before. Yeah. Okay. So the, the other question <coughs> I have is that the school reserve, unassigned, whatever the term is, is $4,429,210 compared to the 1.898 for the municipality have you ever seen that kind of an imbalance you the firm not you the persona uh, off the top of my head I, I, don't, I don't know that I can answer that T typically um, ultimately if the school were to go into a deficit the town would cover their costs and I know that there's always a, a, a you know kind of a push and pull of, of funding I wouldn't say it's more often than not we probably see the general fund have a higher fund balance in the school department but it, it really is up to each town to decide how, how they want to set mm -hmm. that up so and then from last fiscal year to this fiscal year the school reserve using the term loosely it went up nine hundred thirty five thousand two hundred fifty five dollars I think that's correct. Yeah, I was reading it out of your report, so I... Yep, that's correct. Okay. Do you have... you? I think you partially explained where some of that 935 came from, but do you, I think you accounted for about 400,000, if I followed, or did I miss something? 400 was a special ad. Correct. Uh, let me go to my budget page for you. So about $500,000 of that was unbudgeted revenue. Um, portion of that was the Medicaid money, a little over $300,000 was unbudgeted Medicaid revenue. Um, 200, uh, $190,000 was <coughs> Blue Cross Blue Shield credits um, that came back to the school department. Um, and the remainder, uh, the remaining excess was about $456,000 and that was related to um, the special education salaries versus purchase services. Okay. So in total, that's about 961000 They educated me a little bit. When you say Medicaid, how, how does Medicaid flow to the school district? So it's uh, passed through to the school from the state of Rhode Island. Um, <coughs> it's based on how many um, students in the district are allowed to, they're allowed to claim. Um, for for reimbursement, uh, I'm, maybe Denise can speak a little bit more to that. But uh, it's a it's a state program that that everyone um, participates in. So it's not okay. it's not specific to Tiverton, but um, I, I think I might be a little lost on a little bit. It's basically separate aid from the, aid separate from the funding formula that um, is for high cost special ed, uh, primarily out of district 
Okay, so we, we, we circle back to special ed, which is very expensive and very unpredictable. This, no, okay. Those are the truest statements you can make. Yes. <laughs> Jerry just smiled for the first time tonight. <laughs> so, well, my, my concern, if I may express them from a, not, not so much from the audit standpoint, uh, which is interesting, but my concern is that here for the past fiscal year, we've been clawing, looking under seat cushions to find money to keep the trash collected, to keep other critical services like snow plows <laughs> going. And yet we, it, it, it appears, and this is dangerous, I want to use the word appears, we've, we've had while we're scratching over here, we're floating upward in the school reserve. And from a fiscal management standpoint and, and switching over and speaking as an individual taxpayer, it, and I know municipalities, Gadsby and all that stuff, uh, you can't use logic. It is what it is. But it seems counterintuitive that on one side we're scratching to keep critical services going, and on the other, we're floating our reserve up. We seem to be, and that's, that's the forward-looking thing that I'm concerned about, is how can we make sure that we're not starving one side and overfeeding the other? And that's, if you have the answer to that question, I, you can call me collect any time of day or night. I think the town administrator in the morning. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's my questions and my concerns. Thank you. Madam sure. President, I get um, something else just came to mind. When you mentioned the Blue Cross Blue Shield rebates, is that because the school department also participates in the trust, the interlocal trust, and they uh, you can accrue uh, essentially cost savings over a period of time and then take those cost savings when you so choose? Because the town's done it. The town, the town did it like two or three years ago um, when, when Mr. Wojcik was was still here in order to bring down the health cost numbers. We put it, right, that's right I believe you can use it as a credit against your health yeah. expenditures. I think we did that last year, the year before. I'm yes, yeah, I'm just I'm just concerned. I mean, I, I know maybe Dr. Larkin can answer this one, but I, I would think you'd want to roll that money forward if that, that's me, just given the unpredictable nature of the way budgets work here. I know it, sound, it sounds like you guys hug it, so. I'm sorry, I was going to answer. Well, they, they just I, kept I it on the, the side where we put it towards our savings for our health care. Yeah, so, so the town of Tiverton is taking, taking, essentially taking that rep every single year, but the school department hasn't. And so we're sh that, that number shows up and inflates their, their revenue number. So I'm just, I mean, I, I, maybe I would just say, you know, Dr. Larkin, it might be advantageous to just not take it if you don't have to. So you can roll that savings forward it, in the event did, that there it is. It did inflate their revenue number, but yeah. it also inflated their expenditure number as well because the money was came in as both a revenue and an expenditure and was moved to the um, fiduciary trust fund, which isn't part of your governmental fund. Oh, so they, so, you, so they took that money and put it directly into the OPEP. Correct, and I can actually show you exactly where that happened, too. You mean the Blue Cross Blue Shield? Yeah. Yes, that yes. was the net. That was it. Yeah, that was a watch. You know, I might have missed this when I went through it earlier. But it went to OPEP. You'll see that on page thirty. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If you took a if you took a look at page thirty, you'd see on the why aren't why aren't we doing this on the municipal side? Because we just yeah yeah we we used it to reduce our premium because we couldn't afford our premium, <laughs> so that's that's what we had to do. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, I think it's it's important to talk about that because I don't think the residents understand that that's something that we're doing to try and keep the budgets down. So. It's another area we're doing our thing. Okay, any other questions? We have? Anything else? Nope. Any other questions from the Jerry? No? Okay. 
Well, I let the budget committee speak, so I thought I'd have the chairman speak. You know. A conversation at some point. Actually, um, since Dr. Larkin said he was about to answer Cecil's question, I thought maybe he could answer it where we could all hear, if that's okay. I don't remember what Cecil's question was. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, to uh, speak to actually Mr. Leonard's comments, that you know, those are really policy questions, and it is up to the town to decide ultimately where, you know, what is the right. Uh, level of any reserve, either be it municipal or um, schools, and uh, obviously there's lots of things that need to be done in the town. Um, <coughs> but to, to, I'm happy to try and answer any questions I can about the school budget, but I have not had any of this information. Um, I did get the audit finally uh, this afternoon, um, but have not had much of a chance to really look through or digest most of it. But I'd be happy to try and answer questions if I'm able to on that limited I, I, understanding. I have a question. Sure. And, and I just want clarification. Yeah. You don't have the same reserve requirement that we do, like our three percent, right? I mean, do you? Correct. We we do so not. And in fact, I think the town is actually carrying our reserve in that regard right. because it's so a reserve for the total budget, not just everybody. the municipal so we're budget. We're carrying the whole reserve. In 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 what is statutorily required, right. that is correct. However, um, I will make a, you know, I guess advertisement that we have been trying to be very careful with all of our money. Our increases have been very modest over the last five years. And that reserve is going to, you know, as I said, every capital project in the last five or more years has been out of the reserve. Except and the one we bonded for. Correct. And that's because we can't bond. You know, if, if we had had the money in the reserve, which you know, I don't think that's ever going to happen. But if we had fifteen right. million dollars in the reserve, then we could have done that. But the schools cannot independently go for a bond, nor can they, even if they could, because the buildings are owned by the town. The town has to hold the bond. And it's also important for the people to realize that our general fund, the, the, the town council can't tap into that at all without a vote for at the referendum. We Correct. cannot touch that. The school committee can go into that reserve as they right. please, as long and as that, for their and need, as long as for their educational purposes. Right, and that certainly protects the school, the town from the schools ever coming to you and saying, we're at, you know, a zero balance and, uh, you know, that money would go for those types of unexpected. And, you know, again, to speak to what Mr. Leonard was saying, it really does, all, our margin is r quite narrow. It's spe special education is the wild card. We could have a student move into the district tomorrow that will cost us $300,000. And we have, not that we should, but we have no recourse to, to sort of adjust that number. That is a, a total, you know, it's, it's sort of like a tsunami hitting. So, so, so special education funding is, is a very difficult thing to manage. So uh, for the record, this is an abnormal amount of money you have in your reserve. Because when I was at the school committee, it was nowhere near there. Yeah, oh, it's the highest. It's, right, it's, it's the yeah, highest. In yeah, the yeah. And you know, again, if anybody has been in the high school, you can see where yes. some of that money is going to wind up needing to go. So I, I, not directed at Dr. Larkin as though this is your personal responsibility. But I have to say, um, as Cecil pointed out, given the scraping that we've been doing on the municipal side for the last couple of years, and I mean <coughs> really scraping, and we've got, you know, serious needs that are going unmet in terms of, you know, roads and some capital equipment and trucks and things like that. It is a little alarming to me that we're in this position, and I realize the schools can't go out for a bond, but on the other hand, you know, the fifth, maybe the $15 million bond could have been a $14 million bond you know, two years ago, because this year one of our big hits is that not only are we paying the principal, uh, the interest on it, but this year we've got to pay the, the you know, both of them. So it, it's a little hard. It seems like maybe we're a, a little out of balance here because we are really struggling um, to try and support yeah. the municipal side. I, I can assure our you our- Margins are skinny, skinny, yeah. skinny right now. Our reserve is not what it is. <laughs> Two years ago, our reserve was not what it is right now. I don't recall what the exact number was, but it wasn't anywhere close to that. So, this so. Is, so that's 
two year, four million dollars in two years? No. I, well, it was. You know, I'd have to go back and look at the actual numbers, but I think we were cl much closer to somewhere in between two and a half and three. But I'm not. Well, last year it was three. Yeah. Oh no, it's a little higher than three. Yeah. The year before, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, this is ultimately a policy discussion. What is what is the right number <coughs> that the school should have uh, on hand, and what is the right number that the town should have? You know, the 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 what is it, three percent or three and a half percent? I mean, that's a that's a you know a basement number. So, Madam President, if we had if we had a policy in place that told the school department that they could only have one point five million dollar surplus and that's it, they would find a way. Or they would do what they need to do with it. I don't think we can legally do that. No, but if we could, they wouldn't save as much as they have. You could, they should be commended to have that much money there. And now they have it to fix their projects. If we told them you need to only have a million dollars, there was a policy in place, and we set a million dollar policy in the bank only, then things would maybe be in better shape and fixed, but that's all they would have. But they should be commended for saving that kind of money and getting through their budget and their process. I mean, they haven't gotten they haven't gotten an extra nickel from the town. We give them a dollar over the last I don't know how many years. But of course, some will commend us and some will damn us. Yeah, well, you know, if somebody <laughs> oh, told me I, well, I can only well, save a thousand dollars or I got to give it back, I'd spend it all. They tax the tax. That's Absolutely, it's tax. It's taxpayers' money, a hundred percent is tax. But they get two thirds of the budget too. What does that mean? Well, we out of the forty-nine million, they get most of it. The town only gets nineteen; they get the rest. Yeah. So they should have a little bit more savings in the side. I would like to see them throw it into the roof, but we can't make them do that. But I, I would commend the school department for saving some money. Well, anyone's free to come to our meetings and go ahead. Advise us. Keep in mind that we all, all of us taxpayers, just bailed the school department out. Yes, we did. Fifteen million dollar bond. So maybe what we should do for the rest of the municipal. And let me say, I'm being facetious, so nobody quote me. Maybe what we should do, and I'm being facetious, maybe we should throw a $20 million bond to upgrade all the municipal buildings and equipment, pave the roads, et cetera. We're going to. It's called the casino. Well, I, I would certainly take exception to calling the, the bond as a bailout. It would pass 70%, and it was to make needed upgrades to buildings that are owned by the town and are used by the town so any other questions for me oh, if, i just want to add one more thing because i think dr larkin hit on it the 15 million bond, dollar bond is to prevent us from having to pay Correct. 250 million dollars to replace Correct. two buildings because middle schools and high schools are not cheap so i'd rather pay 15 million than 250 million for those buildings but um, that's just my final thought. And the, the state's estimate is that we actually require about $40 million of work on those two schools. So yeah. All right. It is what thank it is. You, Jerry. Thank you. Well, you got 10% of it, Jerry. All right. Um, thank you, Kyle. You're welcome. Councilor uh, Hilton, discussion and possible vote on resolution in opposition to Rhode Island Senate Bill. S245 regarding sports wagering and drugs. Can you take over that for a second? Councillor Hilton. I'm looking for my backup in my pile here. It's a G1. I'm looking for G1. <laughs> so, um, oh, here we go. Um, so there is a bill that has been introduced into the Rhode Island Senate um, which would allow sports wagering. Um, at only two places in Rhode Island, uh, Twin River at Link in Lincoln and at Twin River in Tiverton. Um, however, this legislation, as it ri it's written, indicates that we would get exactly zero, zero cut of the sports wagering that would happen there. And um, I have two concerns with that. One is that I don't really know what the effect of sports wagering is on a community. I don't really know much about it. I don't know what it draws, how it works, or any of those things, number one. And number two, um, I have no idea what, if you were to have sports wagering at uh, the casino, how much that would impact the slots and the table games and whether or not that would significantly impact our um, shear from those things. 
and could it impact this year enough that uh, the state might reconsider their minimum guarantee to us? One of the biggest issues that I have with this particular piece of legislation, and there's a reason that the voter handbook is here, is that this bill supposes that we actually voted for sports betting when we passed the referendum. And when I say we, I mean both Tiverton and the voters of the state of Rhode Island. Because they're making the claim that uh, the words casino gaming in the actual referendum question covers sports betting. However, if you look at the voter handbook, which was provided to every voter by the state, um, with English language definitions of exactly what the referendum questions are asking, it's really clear that the definitions and the explanation per the state says that we were voting only for video lottery terminals, the slots machines, and table games, which include games that are played with dice and other things. So um, I'm suggesting that um, before this thing gets too far, and there is, as far as I can tell, by the way, no uh, companion bill that's been introduced in the House, although the proceeds from this have already been built into the governor's budget. And this is all based on the United States Supreme Court finding in favor of the state of New Jersey to allow sports betting. So I'm proposing that um, Tiverton draft a resolution in opposition to this particular bill. At the very least, um, I, I don't think that um, the state can make the case that we voted for this, um, number one. And I don't think that they can make the case that therefore we voted for it and we're not entitled to a single penny of revenue if in fact that they do this. Um, and we don't really know what the impact would be on um, the revenue stream that has been committed to us. Um, so that's my suggestion. Well, that you're back, Madam President. <laughs> <laughs> Any comment from the council? Um, I have a question for the solicitor. Uh, how does this relate to the deal that we cut with the state and Twin River for our guaranteed money. Um, it's my understanding that at the state level, our deal is already set. It is what it is. And so if the state feels that they can just go ahead and do this thing, um, wouldn't it require a separate referendum for us to amend our deal with the state in order to participate in that revenue? And how would that impact our existing revenue? As, as, I, as I read um, this existing legislation, it would operate outside of yeah. uh, the so-called master uh, agreement uh, with the state, uh, Twin River, and Tiverton being a signatory. That's what's contemplated in the legislation. So that we're talking about the legislation that's being drafted for the Senate, but not the existing legislation for the town of Tiverton. That's correct, yes. This is separate from but this that. this is totally separate. This was not in existence when we, when we made our agreement. That's correct, yes. And, and this not only affects us, but it affects Lincoln also. Yes. This, this would add um, uh, a new section to the state law that governs and, and regulates uh, the um, uh, casino facilities in the state. Would we be bound to the, to the new um, state law saying that, does Tiverton have a choice if the state says, you, we are putting it there and that's it because they're going to get major revenue from it. Does Tiverton have a choice to say, no, we don't want that ga gaming, that, that sports betting? Not, not under this legislation, no. no. So yeah, we, they just stuff it on your throat and say, that's it, you get it and you get nothing? Pretty much. Well, yeah. yes. Well, we need to change the host agreement that says if they do that, we get our cut, we get our 5%, like I asked for last time. Well, we don't even know if Twin Rivers is going to. Will Twin Rivers get a cut of this? Also? Well, they don't, have a, they're not, they don't have an open agreement right now. We have an open agreement. They, we, we're writing our agreement right now. I agree, but what I'm asking Tony is, does no. Twin Rivers get any sporting revenue? Will it just be the state as written? I'd, I'd be surprised if they didn't, but right. I don't think that that's been fleshed out yet. That hasn't been fleshed out, so we don't even, so we don't know if they're going to get any. Yeah, basically what this legislation would do would be to allow um, the uh, two casino facilities to have sports gaming. But as, as you read in, in the legislation, it would be state regulated and state operated sports gambling. So it would be like Keno or something like that, so we don't, you know, 
the town needs if they're going to do that at the state casino lottery. right that's state lottery that's not a, that's not a bad analogy right but we need we need to put in our town our uh, host agreement that we want uh, if the state uh, does this actually does this in Tiverton and it brings the revenue up for the casino we want our cup if we can't stop it we want our cup we got to get our we got to get Tiverton has to get their portion because it's going to bring traffic it's going to bring a lot well, of other it might influence increase the gaming revenue when people are spending their money on the sporting well so long as we get a cut of it who cares well yeah this this, this legislation authorizes the state to have the uh, sports uh, gambling and that you know the uh, uh, host agreements that you, the host agreements that you have with with Twin River. So will it hurt us to add it into our host agreement before it gets signed? I don't know if you're going to be able to. Yeah. Madam President. Well, that's what the state rep told us. Told, I talked to him today, and he said the same thing you just said. He said, "Well, you're not getting any of it." So I would rather not have it if we can't have our our cup. But okay, this is the first step. Yeah. Madam President, um, if you remember, this came up with the Fifth Amendment. That was in when we talked about the uh, host community agreement and remember it, there was this because i remember bringing it up and it is if um what is it we have to have the video lottery games and the table games and if only one of them is offered the state no is not obligated to make up the shortfall so i don't know enough about gambling to know if putting in this uh the sports gambling if the state can then say take out the video lottery games because we're making more money with the um, sports gambling. I, I and if they do that, then they don't, they're not even obligated for the three million. Now when we brought this up at the, uh, in the, in the um, subcommittee, I think both you and uh, Mark Rousseau was saying that that wouldn't happen. They said it couldn't happen by, by the law that they because wrote. Because of the contract, right. right. And they have to hold the machines there for the whole entire Right. for the 30 years That's but, what they but I'm not but you know looking at this kind of stuff it looks like a money grab to me and it looks like if the state and the state can do what they want and they can change definitions it just makes me very leery do you remember this just because yes, we yes, had I it did. a couple of, we had it for a couple of sessions yes okay um, I think it's because I don't know enough about the uh, the sports gambling but if they say, okay, we're making more money on the sports gambling, so knock out, knock out some, knock out your video, is that possible that they could do that? Do you, do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? I'm, I'm going to say no to that. Okay, um, that they couldn't do that. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is going to operate <laughs> separate from the from the uh, uh, table games and the uh, video lotteries. Yeah, I know, but if, if they say that there's making more money out of it, why couldn't they just say, okay, let's just take out the video lotteries from the casino because we're making more money with the sports betting? It's, a, it's just a matter of, is that... Do you, even, even if there was a decrease in the revenue, they wouldn't do that. Okay. Because they're, they're, that would, they would not eliminate an entire revenue stream okay. in favor of um, this one. There might be a decrease, but they wouldn't eliminate that revenue stream. Uh, well, I'm more concerned when they when they have this. I th just thought it was a funny phrase that if we have, you've got to have both, and if you only have one, we're no longer obligated to meet to give you three million dollars. That was my concern. Yeah. Though that's my concern too. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like I thought we said. I thought it was well. You know, the state is going to decide anyhow. Yeah, I don't think this is an either either or. This legislation is either or. Okay. All right. But our, our, our agreement with the state is we're guaranteed that $3 million for 30 years. Guaranteed, no matter what. Well, no, not no matter what, because it says if either video lottery games or table games are no longer offered at the Tiverton facility, then the state shall not be obligated. Right. That's the Fifth Amendment. Well, that's yes. not what Russo said, and that's not what they said at our meetings. They said we are 100% guaranteed that money for 30 years. If... Till 2030. Oh, till 20, I mean, till, till 2030. Yeah. Till 2030. As, it, it's as long as we have both of those. Yes. Right. As long as we have both. Yes. Right. That's it. That's and that's what I'm worried that the state it's will say, okay, we're going to take off one of yes, those, so we're no longer obligated. They wouldn't have spent four million dollars to get table games through, though. I mean, if that was the case, if they weren't, if they were ultimately going to pull table games to, you know, stick it to the town of Tiverton, I mean, they, they, they wouldn't have picked yeah. up and moved out of Newport. 
And not only that, we need to get this in there somehow, where if they do that gaming, if they do that sports well, betting. Tony just said he doesn't think we could do that. No, that, I mean, that's just what he's, he thinks. That, does, that doesn't mean anything. He can think and he can think that we have it. Actually, here's what I'm concerned down. about. Yeah. Um, Councilor Hilton put um, a matter on the agenda uh, related to uh, whether or not uh, the council would support the legislation or not. Um, what you have might be a topic for another day, but under the Open Meetings Act, I think you really have to focus on uh, what you have in front of you, which is whether or not you're going to um, send a resolution to the uh, to the um, State House opposing as to your uh, opposition uh, for this for this legislation. Do we super, can we supersede the state on that on the, at the casino, or, or when they say we're doing it and that's it, and they supersede the town? Or is this just a chance to maybe stop it? No, uh, this, legis this legislation goes through, then the state would be authorized to offer that type of gambling at, uh, at, at the casino here. So this, would, this is really just throwing sheets to the wind and hoping for the best? No, th this legislation would allow them to do that. And I think what the proposal is, is to at least let the state know uh, what the town council is thinking, what okay. the position is on this. All right. Yeah. Madam President? Yes. Um, since we talked in analogies, I'm just trying to think this through here a little bit. But if, hypothetically speaking, Randy and I go into business, right? We're selling, uh, you know, bananas off a banana stand, and then Randy decides he's going to go off and he's going to open a car dealership, right? Uh, to, in my in my ass assessment of sort of what we're talking about, and that car car dealership, by the way, is going to be lo co-located with the banana stand. This is essentially me saying to Randy, "Hey, I want 50 percent of what you make on the car dealership too." And those are sort of real random stuff, but if I read this legislation correctly, if the state's going to determine that Class Three gaming is sports betting, and we have an agreement in place with Twin River and with the state of Rhode Island for Class One and Class Two gaming, do we really want to slap the state of Rhode Island in the face and say, "No, you can't do anything else here unless we get our cut"? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just, it's a thought. I mean, we're, we're, we already are; they're, they're already sinking tons of money into this operation. I just. I would be concerned that you know we may be overextending ourselves, and we have these meetings and discussions all the time where we're going to throw this, that, and the other thing on the table and ask for it from Twin River, which I don't disagree that we shouldn't be doing. But at some point, I'm concerned that we may push hard enough, and they may say okay. enough is enough. Well, John, what does that mean? Enough yeah. is enough. John, I, mean, I don't understand why. It just, I mean, it's just a thought. I would play devil's advocate I mean here. They really can't come. What can they do? The thing, the thing is. Even the lottery commissions where they sell the tickets, they guys get one and a half percent. That's all we're asking for is a percentage. Mm -hmm. If they do that, I want a percentage. I want the town well, to get their money. That's why we should oppose this because well, this is saying that we're not going to get anything. And, and, right, one and of that's what the state's saying we're not going to get anything. I understand. And I talked to the state rep today and he said, you're not entitled to it. It's already all in the I agreement. So I was on. I'm yeah. back to work so I get to sit with them guys every day. So we can oppose Ma this. Madam. President, I'm sorry. Yes. May ahead. I um, may I just respond? Y you know, in addition to the to the gaming revenue issue and whether or not they're going to open up a whole nother kind of of gaming and we're not going to get a penny of it. I, as much as everything, and keeping in mind that this was a close vote in Tiverton, and and there are some people who will tell you that they voted yes for the sole reason that they were interested in um, you know the revenue. The other thing is, if you really read this voter handbook, the claim that this bill is making, that we voted for this, is, you know, at best misleading, at worst, I'm not one is sure I want to say the word out loud of what I think it is. Because when you read through this English translation of what you were supposedly voting, voting for, when you voted on that referendum question, there is no way that you could possibly extrapolate that you were voting for sports betting or any kind of expansion of gambling other than b uh, above and beyond the video lottery terminals and the, um, and the table games. And so, you know, as much as the gaming share is an issue, frankly, the, the honesty to the voters and what was on the ballot is an issue because their claim in this bill, which I think is pretty thin and pathetic, that we voted for this is, you know, and, and I think as much as this year, that that's an issue too. I, I mean, 
you know, we can read in Tiverton. They might not think we can, but we can read in Tiverton. The people that voted for the casino don't care what they do in there. They're just thinking lower taxes and money. That's what they were thinking. Uh, well, uh, right, but. I, I'm sorry, Randy, I don't agree. I think that the people who voted for this do, I think they do care. I, I think that, because I think some people, I mean, it was a close vote, but some of the people who voted for it voted for it for the revenue, but they thought, well, we're going to get table games and we're going to get, you know, video lottery and that, that's what we're getting. If they thought they were getting this too, maybe they wouldn't have voted for it. Yeah, I don't well, know. I know 49% of them wouldn't have voted for it. 51 did. You know, I'm, my opinion is they would have voted for it no matter what. They just wanted lower taxes. All right, so Just the question opinion. is, and I'm going to bring it, I'm going to try to move this. Do we want to oppose this? I, Do we want to um, vote out a resolution to oppose this? I just, I just have one more question, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess I would pose this back to Councillor Hilton, but if there's a strong potential that they might be, may not be able to do this under the law without a separate referendum vote, is it really worth our time to write this and oppose it? Well, I'm first, understanding that's not going to be. I, I first of all, I think even I, I think if we don't get ourselves on record now as saying we're not okay with this and we're not we're really not okay with the way that you're doing this because you're trying to slide this through under some sort of language that really is accurate, then you know we're at you know we're abrogating all of our rights to potentially have a discussion with them and say that this isn't correct and their point is well we don't have to have a referendum because we already had one and you voted for this and my point is mm, no, if you read that voter handbook that you gave us in english no we didn't actually vote for it but so what is the actual law that was passed i mean i, I get what was voted on in the referendum but i mean well, we should defer to the actual text of the law that was passed. Well, which law that was passed? That when we had our referendum. I mean, yeah, the, the law that uh, was enacted in the legislation did not contemplate um, uh, the so-called sports gambling. It, it was for um, table games and also the uh, vid video uh, lottery terminals. That's why this legislation has to be passed. <coughs> Because the because the law doesn't, so they're trying to say it. It we have to pass this law because that wasn't really covered under the vote you took. But actually, you did vote for it. You just didn't know you were voting for it. But you know, but we're going to pass the. It. Anyway, I just think if we're going to have any chance at having any discussion with the state, if we're going to be able to participate in having any say in this whatsoever, you have to go on record saying we have a problem with this, and you know we'd like to discuss it with you. But we have to tell people we have a problem, or we might as well just not have a voice. Councilor Shabbat, I can tell you one last something. Well, <clears throat> I think they're trying to get around having voter approval uh, in this by lumping it under casino gaming, which is creative on their part. Um, but my question is, um, this is the lottery. So the lottery has other games. They have. Powerball, uh, Mega Millions, they have Kino, they have uh, scratch tickets. And did the voters approve that, those items or did the General Assembly just approve those gaming, that particular <coughs> gaming? Because that leads me to my next question. So if, if the voters didn't have any um, say in that and the General Assembly put that forth and said, okay, yep, we're going to have Kino and we're going to put it in um, anybody who applies, we can put it in, uh, you know, grocery stores, we can put it in liquor stores, we can put it wherever, we can put in a terminal, a lottery terminal. <coughs> so if you think of sports betting, it is similar to a kino. You're, you're putting, making a bet based upon values. So I could relate sports betting to kino. And if the legislature approved that without voter approval, then I could see where they could get in this Keno type activity called sports betting. It, it um, all starts in 1974. There was a special <laughs> um, <laughs> constitutional <laughs> convention yeah. uh, which authorized the state to engage in lotteries 
that would include your Mega Millions, your uh, scratch tickets, your Kino, yeah. and all that. that. Those are lotteries. Uh, then what they did is, is, is uh, time marched on, and, and there's Supreme Court cases that analogize uh, the um, video lottery terminals and the table games to the lottery. And I'm not going to get into the law on it. It's very complicated and it'd take about an hour and a half. That's okay. Yeah. But that's, that's what happened. What they're doing here is, is they're saying this, is, this, this sports gaming also falls under that umbrella. The difficulty is, <coughs> is that um, when you have the casinos, um, uh, what the law also is is that there has to be referendums not only statewide but also mm -hmm. locally. So that's the issue. Uh, the issue is, is um, and, and I think that the lawyers that drafted this are saying, um, when, when the vote was taken, uh, this was contemplated. And what Councilor Hilton is saying is, is that, no, it wasn't. Uh, we were going for the table games, right. and that's where we're at. So that's the issue that you have. Uh, the other issue that you have um, uh, comes from uh, Councilor LeBeau, because unlike um, what happened during those votes, <coughs> Uh, what's contemplated here, there is going to be no revenue under this legislation that will accrue to the town. That was part of the vote uh, that was taken, that there would be a certain percentage coming to the uh, town of Tiverton uh, if, in fact, the casino was approved. And I, those are the issues, mm -hmm. and I think what you need to do is just take a vote as to which way you want to go with straight policy. I, I just one point of clarification. So if they're saying that the way that we're getting the sports gambling in is because we all voted and approved it, and that was contemplated when we had a refer referendum election, and we knew going into it that we were going to get a portion, right? How can they then turn around and say, well, you get nothing because it wasn't actually contemplated when you voted in the referendum? This is such a good question. So you, you, you're, 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 they can't you're, use it one way and then you use can't, it the yeah, other. Yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too in that situation, <laughs> and that's where my confusion is on this. Your question suggests the answer. They can't. <laughs> I think, so. I think you're, you're, you're posing a question, and, and you're right. I mean, it's a question, but it's really a statement. And I think that's what you need to decide. Host community <coughs> agreement. Put it in there. If they do it, we get our 5%. I don't know if we, we will. You've got to take it one thing at a time. Right, you've got to Yeah. That's, that's Second plan B. Plan B, right. correct. But what? first make the states. And why is this bill being referred to Veterans Affairs? Uh, because the uh, v Veterans Affairs Committee also, that used to be the Special Legislation Committee, mm -hmm. so they, it's kind of a catch-all. It, even, it even though it says uh, um, Veterans Affairs, it's really the Special Legislation Committee, which has always handled uh, matters relating to gambling. Okay, so the question is, do I have a motion? That would be where we go. I'm going to make a motion that we just wait on the table it until the state actually tries to push it. They are, they are trying to they push are. it. Yeah, but we don't the have Senate anything is trying so to push it. It's There's nothing in the House yet. Yeah, nothing. yeah but that, talk, that can happen so fast. Representative, I would. And there will be. I mean, it sounds like. Well, that that's my motion. My motion is not to okay. not to put this out right now. Do I have a second? Wait. Do I have another motion? Trish, do you want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Um, and, and I'm wondering, uh, given uh, Tony's legislative abilities over there, whether or not he might help us draft this and refer to our issues of both the cut as well as the language. If we like were draft, to draft, draft a resolution in opposition to this bill and any companion house bill. He's going to tell <coughs> Peter right, right now. <laughs> Okay, so is that your motion to do that? Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, just one point. Can we, can we maybe um, tweak our response there to include the question that they need to figure out if they're going to stand on the referendum as being contemplated that it should include what the same deal was that we got with Twin River when we voted on the referendum or it should be a separate referendum. I think the basis of the, the opposition should be the question that I asked. How can you have one 
and the other. I, I don't have a problem with it. I was actually thinking that the resolution bring up should bring up both issues. First mm -hmm. of all, that you're on the one hand you're sit, right, and this is what the voter handbook says, is, and this is what you know. I mean, I I was. I would think that all those things should go into the resolution, including you can't have it both ways here. Because you're explaining, you're right. explaining our thinking. Uh, so yeah, it's really the, the whole. It, it's it's all of them, okay. including your thought on that, which is the exact question. And Tony will draft it, and we'll look at it, and, and we can tweak it to the way yeah. you know we want it. If because even the people that sell kino tickets get a percentage. Right. So exactly. how can you put in sports betting without mm -hmm. a percentage going to the facility that issues the bets? Right. And I can go along with it so long as that's in there. So long as we get a cut. Oh. Well, we, oh, then I can go along yeah. with yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, no one's saying exactly. we're opposing this completely. We're just saying we're opposing what they're what doing they're right yeah, now. I'm opposing that 100 percent too. I want money. That's. that's <laughs> <right>. <laughs> 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 They put it all on black. Okay. Okay. Motion's been made. Second. All those in favor. So this is just a motion. Uh, a motion to have Tony draft something for us to review before we pass yeah. the resolution. Yes. Okay. Okay. Motion's been made and second. I'm not asking for any further discussion. All those in favor. <laughs> Unanimous after all of that. I would just want the money. <laughs> we know. We need the money. Okay. Um, bids and requests for proposals. Council Hilton and the DBW Director Anderson, Grinnell's Beach Improvement Committee, request awards and bid for Grinnell's Beach. Electrical upgrades to Mellow Electric, Far River Mass for $12,920. B, bathhouse sidewalks to Jam Construction, Middletown for $7,056. And one more. I'm going to, well, that's number two, two you yeah, want to go there, too. Nope. Um, permission to purchase precast septic tank from Bristol County Precast West Park Mass for $5,250. No bids received. Advertised twice. Money's there. What? The money's there. We get the money? The money is there. Oh, yeah, it's in the grant. The motion we approve. Okay. Second. Second. Are we approving all three of these at once? Yeah. All three. Okay. <laughs> all the while, well, I haven't asked for the vote yet. <laughs> so <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in go. favor? Moving forward. Thank you, Bill. That was Thank easy. You. <laughs> 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 well, I was like, why can't I get my why yeah, can't why I get my plows right there? Why can't I get my plows like this? <laughs> Town administrative announcements, Nancy. <coughs> Town council announcements. Yeah, I have uh, okay. a couple of announcements. Um, I've spoken to the four finalists for the town administrator. Um, we have set up appointments starting t next Tuesday, February twentieth, at six o'clock. Nancy has the schedule of um, each time, and Nancy also has the resumes for some of you that didn't receive it. Um, it's going to probably be an open session. I'm still discussing that with Tony, but um, but those resumes right now are confidential until we reach the session, um, until I advertise. <coughs> Correct? Okay. And um, if it's a final, int what I'm hoping to do is interview all four, go an executive, discuss what we think, and then decide who we want to do um, background checks on because we, we can't um, really appoint anybody until we get all that done. So that's what I was hoping to do, and then make the final decision for the appointment at, at whenever the backup checks are done, the next town council meeting. Okay. Um, any other council announcements? Yes, Madam, Madam President. Um, so I, in case you all didn't know, the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management um, awarded $3.7 million, uh, $7 million in grants to help communities. Tiverton Land Trust got a $137,000 grant to acquire 42 acres in the Pocasset Ridge Conservation Area. And Tiverton Land, and that was also with uh, the town of Tiverton, open space under the open space grant program and the Nature Conservancy. So they all worked together to conserve that. Also, the uh, Tiverton Land Trust got $96,000 to acquire 68 acres also in the Pocasset Ridge area. Um, so, so far, that's uh, 102 acres that have been saved for open space and at $233,000. And that was overwhelmingly improved by the voters of Rhode Island, that bond. 
And so just to let you know, it's in the it, Cassett Ridge area, it's all in that. It's not taking away any, there's no roads up there. You, you're not going to build any houses up there. You're not going to build any businesses. It's just one continuous area of open space. So congratulations to the groups for working together. Any other town council announcements? I have one. Go ahead, I, I have a, just a, um, Do you want money? No, I do want money, and this is what this is about, money. Um, I talked to Nancy two weeks ago about getting on the agenda tonight, and, uh, and I didn't get on the agenda about, um, I kind of, I guess I dropped the ball. I want to talk about the casino revenue, where it's going to go. Um, I would like to, Tony to draft up a ordinance to, <coughs> to put the money in certain uh, restricted accounts before um, the charter review comes in front of us and tries to put it places where it shouldn't go. Um, I'm, that's something drawn up. John and I have been working on it. Uh, I was supposed to get it to Nancy in time. I, apparently I didn't. So we're going to uh, have it ready for her before the next meeting. And um, we'll break it up. And but, then we'll have Tony to And then we'll have, well, we need to discuss, we need to get something in place because we've been. Put it on the next agenda. And then for the next I agenda. Even away nope. To nope. I know it's my okay. fault. I, I got busy. It snowed. I crashed. So. Can we uh, can we open it up for discussion? For because I know I've been looking at the the charter revision committee. They're also not in agreement. It sounds like everybody has this idea that twenty five percent for capital improvement. That yeah, seems to be in agreement. But other excuse yeah, me. Go ahead. No, 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 I'm go sorry, but yeah, no, 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 go. This is way off. It's, it's something yeah. something okay. best left for. Um, Once we get it on the agenda, yeah, get it on okay. the agenda so it can be. But discussed. we can have discussion. Oh yeah, yeah but yeah. not now. Okay. 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 I, I have That's it. I'm done. <laughs> um, just want to let everyone to know the Arts <coughs> Council is having their uh, reception on uh, February 18th from 2 to 4 at the town hall here. Uh, as you can see, we have some okay. pictures here that are from um, examples of artwork from the school children of Fort Barton. So if you'd like to stop by on, on this coming Sunday between 2 and 4 and uh, get some refreshments and meet some of the, the kids that um, participated in this display. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. No, don't worry. I'd, I'm going to uh, I'm I'd just like to publicly thank uh, the people that sent cards, uh, fruit baskets, and their prayers, and especially the fire department for um, helping me and my family in a time of need. Thank you. And we're very happy of the outcome and that you're back with us. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, Councilor, any announcements? Yes, I, and I, I just want to uh, let the council know because I know that some of you have been contacted, but uh, uh, there was a lawsuit that filed against the town last week. Uh, it's uh, Pauline and Edward uh, Berube, uh and the uh, defendants are the town of Tiverton itself, town code enforcement, uh, Tiverton Police Department, and the Tiverton Fire Department. I also wanted to let you know that uh, uh, a temporary restraining order was denied. Uh, last week, and uh, the um, um, uh, preliminary injunction hearing has been scheduled by the uh, Newport County Superior Court for Wednesday morning uh, at 9.30. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the staff has been uh, very helpful in preparing this case on very short notice. Thank you. Town clerk items and announcements? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Council Edwards? Madam President. Nothing to say tonight. Go nothing ahead. to say. Madam President, I'd like to make a motion to go in a closed executive session. Interim Town Administrator 42465A1, Personnel Code Enforcement Officer, Performance Evaluation, Notice Given. Uh, uh, Madam President, before the uh, vote is taken uh, on this, uh, the um, uh, personnel, the employee has uh, in writing uh, requested uh, that this matter be uh, held in open session. Uh, which is uh, his right under the uh, Open Meetings Act. I'm aware of that, but the town administrator would like to go into executive prior to that open session. Is that okay? Um, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend against that. I think yeah. yeah. All right. I, I thought we discussed this today. I thought she discussed this today, but that's okay. All right. So. So we're gonna do that in open, so I can. So we're not going to vote on this at all. We're not going to vote on this at all. It's going to happen. Yes, that 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 matter should be should be held in open session. Okay. Okay. Next. 
Next one. All right. So uh, I'd like to make a motion to go into closed executive session. Council President, collective bargaining, 4246-5A2, update on negotiations, IAFF and IBPO. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion's been made and second. All those in favor, Joe? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And continuing in closed executive session, Councilor Hilton litigation 4246-5A2, Tiverton Four Corners. Second. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, um, Tony, before I go into open uh, the executive session now that we just did these two motions, do I do the first one in uh, open before I go into executive session? No, I, you know, I, I got to tell you, I think what you ought to do is just uh, take care of number items two and three first, and then, be very quick. Mine's gonna be then come back, come back.